Why spring cleaning always have to come after winter? What the hell is this? Oh my god, I thought I had these destroyed after Wilson Gate. Yeah, we'll soon fix that. Where's my evidence destroying hammer? Hey, I'm Carrie Juice. Don't be upset. Today's the greatest day ever. In fact, let's give each other gifts. Yoink! Hi! Doodles! Get back here, you evil nest quick buddy! Wow! Oh my god, my maid cafe at the Adams family. Hello, my name is Malice. Are you quite alright? Yeah, fine. I was just looking for a. A black rabbit? You. yeah. Carrying a hard drive? Yeah! And you escaped from the American McGee Institute, hoping that if you bring him back, it'll prove to the world that you're not a psychotic maniac? That's a hard no, but 203 ain't bad. So have you seen him? Oh, yeah, that way. Ooh, hi <laughs> Oh, what the hell's going on here? Here, drink this. It'll make your tolerance for overused cliches ten times smaller. What the hell are you talking about? I'll oh, forget it. <laughs> what is this, some sort of LSD land? You're not too far off, actually. It's Burton Land. God, look at this place. Like a coloring book if the only crayon available was gray. Oh, come now, it's not all that bad. At least it's creative. <sighs> yeah, the first million times, sure, but the million then one... The... Just as bad as when he took over Disney's Alice in Wonderland. Oh, but I love that cartoon. No, not that one. I hate the fact that I have to make that distinction now. No, I'm talking about Disney's Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. That was a big hit. If it was so bad, why did it make so much money? Oh, I can answer that. Oh God, it's Danny Elfman. What's the matter, critic? I thought you enjoyed my musical composition. Yeah, for the first 10 years, now all your stuff sounds like the filler music you skip on soundtracks. Oh, but critic, don't you know that kind of repetition is what makes Burton Land so popular? It's Tim. Baton! The spirals everywhere. It's Tim. Let's get you fucked up hair. It's Tim. Where everything is style over substance, but it looks good, so who cares? It's Tim! It's Tim. Baton! All angles are skew. It's Tim. With foggy lenses, too. It's Tim. We're all supporting characters. Our king's holding the movies on the wings, and all the leads are about as interesting as glue. It's Tim! This world of such uniqueness has been done a million times. A dark and gloomy outlet for some further nights to whine. And though it's saying little, hipsters think it's saying more. It's selling much more whiteness than a rich albino whore. Remakes, reboots, they're making us a ton of loot. And anything that's new is rare. And yes, the style's showing wear and tear, but all the profit's clearly there. And will it get old? We don't care. Try something different. We don't dare, cause our supplies are dark and dies are making millions by the share. Tim Burton! Very good. Uh, we're looking for the Black Rabbit. If and you don't now, mind. the rendition with the whimsical choir that can only sing in vowels. Oh, 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 oh. I beg pardon, but this doesn't help us. If you could just direct us... Well, I tried to be nice. Excuse me. Oh my god, what are you doing? Oh god, no, not that! Oh no, put that back in my body! Oh no, I need those! I need those! Oh god! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh, I've never felt so much better! Then. He says we just follow that road. Goody. 
You go in front of me while I start the review. Very good. He seems so nice. We see a young Alice being awoken by nightmares as her father tries to put her asleep while discussing trading and business. I see strange creatures. What kind of creatures? There's a dodo bird, a rabbit, in a waistcoat. You're mad. Bonkers. Off your head. I think this calls for a good bleeding. That's what solves every problem in this time period. But I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. <laughs> So father's so perfect he surely has to die soon, die soon after Alice's 19th birthday. This leaves her with a mother who's certainly a product of the times, who is not willing to accept Alice because, of course, she's ahead of her time, and doesn't realize that the ahead of the times cliche has been done so many times that it actually makes it behind the times. Where's your corset? I'm against them. But you're not properly dressed. Who's to say what is proper? What if it was agreed that proper was wearing a codfish on your head? Would you wear it? To me, a corset is like a codfish. And now it's time for tired oppression cliches for tired free-spirited whippersnappers. And no stockings. Woo! Most unorthodox. I was wondering what it would be like to fly. Oh, how uncivilized. My father said he sometimes believed in six impossible things before breakfast. Oh, heavens to Betsy. When in doubt, remain silent. Oh, much better. Do you know what I've always dreaded? Ugly grandchildren. Oh. How very proper! I don't know if I want to marry him. Whoa! How obviously not stuck up and wrong! I hope no other character in any other movie ever made repeats what she does in this film! That would be randy! Hey, Mish, do you have a tire of Quadrille? On the contrary, I find it invigorating. Uh, yeah, bad screenwriting 101, guys. A good writer focuses on what a character is, not what a character not isn't. We know that Alice isn't following the norm, isn't as submissive as her peers, and isn't going to be told what to do. Well, okay, that's all fine and good, but what is she then? Um, blander than bread? I can see you're very close. Look, you won't mention this to your sister, will you? I don't know. I'm confused. Are you sure she's not a product of the emotionless Victorian era? The gardeners have planted white roses when I specifically asked for red. You could always paint the roses red. And of course, as it goes, all the things that Alice will come across inevitably will work their way into her fantasy world as well. Like the owner complaining about the white roses, talking to Tweedle kinda and Tweedle sorta. And of course, what seems like an insane society needing to be challenged. Will you be my wife? But this is happening so quickly, are you? So she turns down the proposal of one of the lesser Weasleys, mostly because... She sees the white rabbit? Wait a minute. So, they're clearly establishing that none of this is a dream and that it's all reality? Okay, despite the fact that this is clearly going against what the original book was doing, why would all these obvious symbols that worked its way into the fantasy be presented? I mean, what's the point if it's all real? I mean, it's suddenly being like, Oh, hey, Santa Christ. Hello. What are you doing here? I don't know. So of course Alice follows him down the rabbit hole, and things look pretty promising as the wacky and nonsensical spirit of Wonderland seems to be shining through. Yeah, now all she needs is a script that says, write me. She of course shrinks down, wearing a convenient mini dress that she had on her. Maybe she was gonna play goth Barbie later. And enters the rather gray and blurry world of Wonderland. There is no life I know, phoned in lie, computer generation. I told you she's the right Alice. I am not convinced. Oh, I'm sorry. Eek, or emotional reaction, or... I don't know, I guess I'm sticking with nothing. She's the wrong Alice. Mm, if she was, she might be. Absalom will know who she is. I'll escort you. Hey, it's not been your turn. You'll notice quickly that all the characters speak to her like they've encountered her before. And that's because they have. Yeah, I bet you thought you were going to get the story of Alice in Wonderland, didn't you? God, I don't know how the fuck you got that stupid idea. But no, this is a semi-sequel, not based on the semi-sequel, because all the logic they semi-throw in, semi-makes no sense. Unroll the oraculum. 
They inform her that the Red Queen has taken over with her evil Jabberwocky, and that this ancient calendar, which is never wrong, claims that she will defeat it. It tells her each and every day since the beginning. Frab just being the day you slay the Jabberwocky. That being you there with a the Vorpal sword. No other swords can kill the Jabberwocky. Oh great, another prophecy story. You know, why are these so popular? Why does everyone go along with something because the prophecy said so? What reliable source do these prophecies come from? Who writes them? How do we know they can be trusted? Sir, Wonderland is checking up on their prophecy. I told him to check that weird calendar thing I made up. And Narnia? I, I don't know. A beaver shall lead the way for the bed knobs and broomsticks kids with the Lion King. Dune? A chosen one. Matrix? A chosen one. Phantom Menace? A chosen one. Jesus? Um, let's leave that one up to interpretation. I don't see anyone going too crazy over that one. Hey, is it me or does that guy look familiar? Nope. Oh, okay, it must be one of those fights. Ah! Hey, 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 hey! Oh, happy day, oh, happy day. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. What's he so happy about anyway? Ah! Oh. Who in the blazes are you? If you're looking for strangeness, you needn't look harder. For he's Tweedle Depp and I'm Tweedle Carter. Oh, that's right, the ceremonial Johnny Depp and Helena Bottom Carter appearances. But I thought that they were talented actors, playing a variety of characters. They were, until they found their niche playing crazy, eccentric, homeless-looking people. For I'm the Mad Hatter and her, the Red Queen, we chew up the scenery scene after scene. We act through bad wardrobe and hair that's insane, and makeup so thick it rival Hunger Games. We bulge out our eyes. And twiddle our fingers. Doing this gets us both round near ten figures. Yes, and as you'll notice, neither of them really do anything different. After Alice escapes one of the Queen's monsters by being defended by a mouse, in the most PG way possible, by the way, <laughs> a family bitchin'. She comes across the Mad Hatter, who is apparently so mad that he keeps alternating between accents. You're absolutely Alice, I'd know you anywhere. I'd know him anywhere. The Jabberwock with eyes of flame, jaws that bite and claws that catch. Investigating things that begin with the letter M. Of course, but now you're back, you see, and we need to get on to the Frabjous Day. You have any idea what the Red Queen has done? You've lost your muchness. Juggling, slurking your fault. Of course, his not very lunacy is only offset by Helena Bottom Carter's not very lunacy as she plays the Red Queen. And actually, at first, it almost kind of works. Because in the beginning, she seems to get upset over stupid, silly things, like who ate her tarts. Did you steal my tarts? No, Your Majesty. I was so hungry! Open his head! That's in keeping with the nonsensical spirit of the book. But, for whatever fucking reason, they keep bringing in this political power struggle and talk of the prophecy, and that's not what Alice in Wonderland is about! It's supposed to be a fun road trip of dreamlike nonsense, an escape from reality through creative surrealism. It's supposed to be a childlike experience, not a fucking war movie! But listen, these characters constantly talk like they're in a war movie. When the White Queen once again wears the crown. Like not slaying anything. Down with the bloody big head. The entire world is falling to ruin. We're going to rescue him. That is not foretold. Down with the bloody Red Queen! Oh, come on. Could you see the Mad Hatter getting involved with a cause? The communist flag will rise! <laughs> Can you see the original Cheshire Cat getting invested with freedom fighters? I never get involved in politics. Oh, is that why you constantly get involved with political movements every couple of scenes? Goodbye. Why bring sense and logic to a world that celebrates having no sense and logic? It just sucks the fun out of it. Who would want fun when there's gloom instead? That's like talking through your teeth, not hearing what's said. I'm wearing stripes. I apologize, but they annoy me. Doing I'm going to kill them. What, what, what is wrong with you? You're usually so nice! Stop killing people! Oh, I'm afraid I already did when you looked over there. What? I didn't look over there. Damn it! You really did escape from a mental institution! Well, I assume you did too, given how you're dressed. Yeah, but I'm a celebrity. When you dress weird, it's crazy. When I dress weird, it's on card. Alice 
us know that Wonderland used to be ruled by the White Queen, played by Anne Hathaway, until the Red Queen summoned her Jabberwocky to destroy everything. Oh, the heartbreaking tragedy. If only there was some sort of warning they could have had to prepare them for this. Like a calendar that predicts the future and is never ever wrong- Wait a minute! Didn't they say that fucking thing predicts whatever's gonna happen? It tells of each and every day since the beginning. Well, why the flying hell were they just partying then? Did they miss the part where we all burn and get our asses fried? You'd think somebody would put a goddamn bookmark on that section, wouldn't you? That White Queen's doing a heck of a job. Hold on tight, please. So the Hatter sees the guards coming, thus swings Alice away on his hat. Which, by the way, even then she looks disinterested. Oh no, I guess. And he's taken away. Thankfully, one of the guards' dogs finds Alice, but she discovers that he's a spy for the Rebellion. Would your name be Alice, by any chance? Yes, but I'm not the one that everyone's talking about. The Hatter would not have given himself up just for any Alice. Yes, that would be mad. And nothing in his name indicates he'd be anything like that. We're going to rescue him. That is not foretold. I've been accused of being Alice and of not being Alice, but this is my dream. I'll decide where it goes from here. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. Alice this whole time, I mean like 80% of the goddamn movie, totally believes that this is all a dream. This is my dream. This is my dream. It's only a dream. I'm still dreaming. Wake up from this dream. Time can be funny in dreams. Sometimes I forget that this is all a dream. I would dream up someone who's half mad. You know, I think there's only so long a person tells themselves that they're asleep before fucking reality starts to take effect. I mean, the dream excuse can only get you so far before your other senses start to kick in. For example... Oh! It's okay, it's just a dream! Oh! It's okay, it's just a dream! It's okay, it's just a dream! You see? On top of that, if she does think this is all a dream, what does she care what happens to the Hatter? What does she care if it's her fault? She has no obligations in a dream. Though, then again, maybe that would explain why her performance is about as invested as Willy Wonka saving a bratty child. I'll decide where it goes from here. If you diverge from the path... I make the path. Stop, don't, come back. So she makes it to the castle where, again, in a PG film, she climbs over the severed heads in a bloody river of the Queen's victims. A Disney picture! And eventually comes across the captured White Rabbit. I've come to rescue the Hatter. You're not rescuing anyone being the size of a gerbil. Would well, you have any more of that cake that made me grow before? Actually, I might have some left. And this is another reason why Wonderland doesn't work as a strategic world of war. There's cake that makes you grow huge. Whoever has that shit, battle over. You win. Mass produce that shit and make an army of King Kongs. You can squash this place like a Lego city faster than you can say curiouser and curiouser. It's like if Malice and I had some of that cake and we suddenly came across a threat. <laughs> I am the terrible Jibber Jabber, writer of these terrible movies. Allow me to make your lives more needlessly complicated. Oh dear. But no! Rather than kill the queen in her tracks, even though she's a giant, she makes up a story about who she is. Why? What's the purpose? She could bite her head off like a fucking animal cracker! I've been growing an awful lot lately, so I've come to you hoping you might understand what it's like. Anyone with a head that large is welcome in my court. Okay, whatever. So the queen takes her in, and Alice eventually tries to break the hatter out, as well as find the sword to defeat the Jabberwocky. Tweedles. Alice! How do you do again? Where's the rabbit? Over there. Oh, that's Wonderland. Nothing makes any sense. Wait, now they're taking her to where he is. But you just pointed in the opposite direction. Are you taking him there? Or are you not taking him there? What? I is there any goddamn consistency in this place? Should we just rename the characters the kind of Mad Hatter? Should we change the phrase to just a little quirky but still totally reasonable as a March Hare? But before she can get the sword, she has to deal with this weird scene with the leader of the guards played by Crispin Glover. I like you, um, I like largeness. Wow, Burton's really working through some issues with this movie, isn't he? Next, she'll be telling me he has a thing about rats. 
So she does find the sword and manages to befriend the beast by giving him his eye back. She's unable to save the Hatter, but the beast does carry her over to Epcot Gondor, where the White Queen awaits. Come with me. Could use some salt. That's my attempt at being funny. It'd be funnier if I was funny. Wait a minute, they're shrinking her down? Why the flying fuck are they shrinking her down? She has to fight a gigantic Jabberwocky, remember? Did we forget our little stomp talk? <laughs> Come on, guys, this makes about as much sense as the Cheshire Cat wanting to help the Rebellion but uses his godlike powers just to save one person. Good morning, everyone. Oh, come on! He could turn into Godzilla and squash the place if he wanted! There's a bajillion things he could have done here! He could win this war in a blink of a goddamn eye! But hey, like he said... I never get involved in politics. Only when bad writing dictates so. Goodbye. So the Mad Hatter is saved, but they still had to figure out how Alice is going to defeat the Jabberwocky on the day of battle. Which, of course, shouldn't matter, seeing how even now she still thinks this is all a dream. Thank God this plot thread has a running time past five seconds of tolerance. Still believe this is a dream, do you? Of course. This has all come from my own mind. Okay, honey, no offense, but you're way too boring to think up anything as creative as this. I think the most your mind could dream up is a paperclip on a rice cake. That's how exciting your imagination gets. And yet... In a confusing scene, even though they all know it has to be Alice, they ask who'll stand up and fight for the White Queen. Who will step forth to be champion for the White Queen? That would be I. No, me. I'll do it. You have very poor evaporating skills. I should be the one. Oh, that's very big of you, seeing how you never get involved, involved in, in politics. politics. Don't stand has more consistency than you. But then they remind themselves of what they already know! Alice has to do it! The choice must be yours. Because when you step out to face that creature, you will step out alone. Why? Because some magic toilet paper told you so? Why does any of this have to be this way? It doesn't! It's total bullshit! For a world that's apparently supposed to have no rules, there sure do seem to be a lot of... RULES! But wait, it gets better. The caterpillar reveals the great big shocking twist. Are you ready? Oh man, this is gonna blow your mind, right? It's so shocking, you're not gonna believe. Okay, you ready? Here we go, here we go. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Alice, this whole time, was Alice. Going to die. Wait, what? Alice, at last. What do you call yourself? Alice. Z. Whoa, wait a minute, movie. So, are you suggesting that the Alice from Alice in Wonderland this whole time was Alice from Alice in Wonderland? Whoa, I, I mean, fucking whoa, this movie is pushing the envelope of cinematic twists. I mean, who could have seen that coming? Next, you'll be telling me that Clark Kent all this time was Clark Kent. Man, this movie knows how to keep you on your fucking toes. It wasn't a dream at all. It's a memory. This place is real. So are you, and so is the Hatter. Ding, ding, ding! What do we have for her, Johnny? You were just as dim-witted the first time you were here. You called it Wonderland, as I recall. Wait a minute. What was that line? You were just as dim-witted the first time you were here. You called it Wonderland, as I recall. Well, if it's not called Wonderland, what is it called? Crimes against Underland. 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 So let me get this straight. In Alice in Wonderland, the story based on the Lewis Carroll novel, Alice is not a girl, she's a woman, she's not in Wonderland, she's returning to Wonderland, and Wonderland itself, in fact, isn't Wonderland at all, it's called Underland. Underland? Under- It sounds like a made-up world in a Fruit of the Loom commercial! I I'm sorry, how the flying fuck am I supposed to take an adaptation seriously when you can't even get one word, one fucking word of the goddamn title right? 
I'm gonna say it. No, critic. No, no, I'm gonna say it. Critic, you I'm sorry. No, don't hold me back. Don't hold me. I'm critic, gonna say it. No, I'm gonna say it. I'm saying it's pushed me this. I'm sorry. It pushed me. I said no. Care Bears in Wonderland is a better adaptation than this. Yeah, come on. I said it. I said it. Who wants them? Come on. Come on. Apart from at least giving us what the fucking title promises, Care Bears in Wonderland and not Underland is still mad nonsense where everything is backwards. The villain of the movie wants to bring sense and order to it. That would be a legitimate threat to their world. So the fear in the movie is 100% justified. Here, the queen is just a jerk. But as long as she's as crazy as the rest of them, which she supposedly is, Wonderland, oh, I'm sorry, Underland shouldn't care. Because unless you missed what was constantly hammered in, both the story, the book, every interpretation ever made, they're mad. They're all fucking mad. So what should they care about any of this bull crap? And don't get me wrong, Care Bears is an awful movie. It's really bad. They do some stupid shit like making the queen nice, a whole bunch of other fuck. But in terms of which one is closer to the spirit of what Alice in Wonderland is, I'm sorry, the fucking Care Bears got closer. They embrace the insanity of Wonderland. This one is a shame to even be called Wonderland. Fuck that shit. What? Um, speaking of things we're ashamed of. Hey, who are we? There he is! Let's go get him! Ah! Oh, 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 man. I am the great and powerful Tim. <laughs> well, God damn it, Burn! you're not even ripping off the right source material. <laughs> you're destroying the Wizard of Oz. You'll need to do that. Sam Raimi already did that. Critic, why do you hate my work so much? I'm just trying to bring something creative and new. Then bring us something creative and new, not trying to destroy what was already fine with your tire cliches. I mean, look at this climax. I think the only reason you allow these adaptations to be so war-hungry is because you like getting shots of armies lining up. Seriously, look at all these movies that you've used them in. You're like obsessed with them. Hey, now come on. Those scenes came from Mars Attacks, Planet of the Apes, and Batman Returns. As we all know, those are critically acclaimed masterpieces, but they look so cool. We see Alice dressed up as Joan of Meh, and they have their dumbass little battle. We meet on the battlefield once again. That's enough chatter. I'm the wild eccentric one where I come from. And again, in our PG film, we get a rather gruesome decapitation of our fearsome Jabberwocky. Off with your head! A fiend leaping. Oh my god, oh, oh my god, oh, 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 Bring the kitty. We follow you no more. So that takes the Red Queen out of power, Queen Uninteresting is in control again, and the Hatter feels he can finally celebrate by doing his dance. Oh, the head just did. Kalu! Whoa, wait a minute. Is Wonderland, oh, sorry, Underland, getting jiggy? I think it is! Boy, he ain't no paper man! He really swings out with a mess of jive! Oh my god, I haven't seen anything this crunk since I saw Vanilla Ice crack into the tune of macaroni and cheese! Oh, Hatter, you be dope! Okay, are you sure you didn't escape from a mental institution? So Alice goes back home, apparently wiser and somehow even blander. Sorry, Hamish, I can't marry you. I love you, Margaret, but this is my life. You're lucky to have my sister for your wife, Lowell. That is no prince, Aunt Imogen. You need to talk to someone about these delusions. Don't worry, Mother. I'll find something useful to do with my life. And you, you wanted a brain. What you don't have is a diploma. You and I have business to discuss. Shall we uh, speak in the study? Oh, and one more thing. My god, her boring personality is in direct conflict with our boring personalities. Most unorthodox! So she uses her newfound expertise in sword fighting and monster slaying into the trading business. Which this movie never mentions she has any knowledge of to begin with. It's vast, the culture is rich, and we have a foothold in Hong Kong. 
So she sails the wonder, oh, don't you mean under, where she sets to start her brand new life. Hello, Absalom. Really? That's our big closer? I've seen more thrilling conclusions out of bandstand bears. So, Critic, what do you think of my blockbuster masterpiece? I'm sorry, I know a lot of people really enjoy this movie, but I just think it's awful! Oh. What should have been a match made in heaven turned into a needlessly complicated storyline from a seemingly simple source material. How can a movie based on a pointless book be even more pointless by trying to give it a point? On top of that, the film thinks that the more evil it can make the villains, the more interested we'll be in our heroes, rather than just writing the heroes interestingly. You can make it dark, you can make it intense, but unless you have a coherent story and characters that have a little bit more charm than snake vomit, it doesn't amount to anything. Sometimes the visuals are nice and once in a while it brings out a little bit of the zaniness from the book, but most of it misses the spirit, the charm, and yes, even the wonder that made Alice in Wonderland so great. I bet even Malice could do a more Tim Burton-style Alice in Wonderland sequel than Tim Burton could! Come on, y'all knew we were going there. But, Critic, I thought you liked my work. I did when you did original stuff. Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas, those were all great! But now all you do is terrible remakes! Well, that's all part of being an artist, Critic. I mean, some ideas hit bullseyes and others are dead on arrival. But you just keep trying. Not if you keep living in another person's shadow. I mean, no good can ever come of that. I think this video begs to differ. What? No! Please don't hurt me. What is a creepy girl of indiscernible age? Some home movies of the Critic's room when he was young. Please don't. Well, looky here. Looks like somebody was living in somebody else's shadow. Oh my god, you are a fanboy of me? It looks like he has a full corner of his room dedicated to you. I just really liked your work, that's all. And maybe I did a few fan drawings every once in a while. A lot of that looks pretty creative. Most of it's crap! But some of it's good. You see, Critic, just because you're interpreting someone else's work doesn't mean some good can't come out of it. After all, didn't you enjoy Sweeney Todd? Yeah, but... And didn't you like Big Fish? Yeah, but... And isn't one of your favorite movies of all time my adaptation of Batman? Yeah, but that doesn't excuse bad remake after bad remake. And Alice in Wonderland... I'm sure will never be remade again. Well, just because it's been done a million times before doesn't mean it'll be done a million times again. Critic, this is just how artists work. Sure, I'll make a lot of crap. But for every Dark Shadows, there's an Edward. For every Planet of the Apes, there's a Beetlejuice. In fact, my next movie is called Big Eyes, based on the artist who did that kitsch artwork in the 60s and all the trials and tribulations she had to go through. Actually, that sounds kind of interesting. And based on another source material. <sighs> Alright, for the good of the creative mind, I guess it's good to put up with some crap every once in a while. But wait, there's still one thing I never figured out. Why was the Black Rabbit so happy all this time? Oh, isn't it obvious? This is the first Tim Burton project to ever have a black man in a main role. No. There was Harvey Dent. Oh. Wait, no, he was in the main character. There was Oogie Boogie. No, he only came in the last third. Oh my god, you're right! See? You know, for a director who celebrates black and white, you sure do put a lot more emphasis on the white than you do the black. Nevertheless, go forth, my young one, back into the real world to look forward to the wonders that Burton Land will bring unto you. <sighs> I will, Mr. Burton. I know you won't let me down. I'm sure I won't either. Tim Burton's eagerly anticipated Big Eyes has been canceled. Replaced with his latest cinematic creation, Adventure Time, starring Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter. I completely forgot whatever lesson I was supposed to learn. Done.
Bet! Huh? Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to another edition of Old vs. New. It's the fairy tale that teaches kids all around the world that it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from, as long as you work hard and have a kind heart, you too can get a makeover. Cinderella is a tale that's been told countless times, but the most definitive version belonged to Disney Animation in 1950. So it only figured when you have a moneymaker so iconic that it's cemented in everybody's memory, you remake it 65 years later! To much surprise though, not only were there big names and astounding visuals, but it also got quite the critical backing too, with people praising it for being such a stylized update. But as always, which one is better? Which one feels the most engaging, clever, and all around magical? Now, of course, being of the nostalgic persuasion, I have a little bit of a leaning towards the old. If only I could wish for someone that had an opposite opinion of me. If only I could wish for someone that had an opposite opinion of me. If only I could- Where the hell are you?! Sorry, this thing is really hard to walk in. <laughs> Christ, even when I want you in a video, you can't get it right! Hey! Give me a chance. I have whimsical support on this one. Yeah? Who? Devil Bonnie! Great. What whimsical support can you offer? Hey, I can get in touch with my feminine side! What? Sparkle! Butterflies! Explosions! No. Oh, oh, okay, no explosions, no explosions, but, um... Ponies? Ponies? Ponies! How are you two still a thing? What can I say? I love a woman that writes fan fiction about me! Oh, and we both held you hostage that one time, so we have that in common. Give it a better. You did! No, you did! You did. No, you did! <laughs> you did! You did! You did! You did! You did. <laughs> Hyper, isn't Benny gonna feel weird that you have another outlet for mindless violence? Oh, come on! He's a professional assassin! This kind of thing doesn't bother people like him! It's nothing, Benny. Nothing. Just add her to the list. Okay, are you gonna debate me on these Cinderella movies or not? There is no debate. The new one is better. If for no other reason than the lead actress had to lose two ribs to fit into that dress. But it's so sexist and bland! The original is sexist and bland! You just like it because there's more flashy sparkles to play to your inner five-year-old! You're a flaky, flailing, flashy holic! What did you call her? Honey, honey, I'm gonna do the crossover. Why don't you go start a war with a random country? Oh! I get to use my random war generator! Jamaica it is! So, Hyper, are you ready to be proven wrong once again? The day you start being right. Let's do Cinderella Old vs. New. Sometimes a prince leaves no impact on you whatsoever. Dude, too soon. I was talking about the royal position. And I'm not. He's the arm candy of our main character's dream. Let's take a look at Best Prince. While a lot of people give flack to some Disney princesses for not having enough character, people forget the princes often weren't even given time to have character. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and yes, Cinderella all have princes with only a handful of lines. And where the one from Sleeping Beauty fought a dragon, and the one from Snow White saved her from death, this one yawns. Okay, look, it was a different time. A time when yawning was an attractive trait? I don't think you're taking into account how sexy that yawn was. Heck, his father gets more screen time than this. So does his servant, for that matter. Yes, yes, but through them we're discovering the prince's character. And they are also relaying the chemistry between our two romantic leads. You got nothing. I got nothing. 
Now with the remake, not only is the prince given a lot more on-screen time, but there's also a lot more time to develop their chemistry. Cinderella and him meet before the ball, and they have time to talk like normal people and build an appreciation of each other. Even during the ball, they talk and share experiences that help them build a stronger connection. She doesn't just see him and declare, this is love, like in the original. I wouldn't know anybody who did that. I've moved on, Critic. I found a more sensible love. Hey, babe! It turns out it's easy to start a war with this place! You just tell them that Cool Runnings is a 100% true story! Bring me back a Rasta hat, Smoochums! Will do! Ah! Okay, so maybe this prince has more charm, more personality, more screen time, more chemistry, and pretty much more of a connection with everybody he comes in contact with. But there is one thing that prince does not have. A shit ton of eyeliner! Dude, again, too soon! Just take the point. After you give him an apology. <sighs> He's waiting. Disney has always created the greatest villains. And what's scarier than a middle-aged woman who's obsessed with housework? Virtually anything! This is best villain! This one is rough because it really is like comparing apples to oranges. Well, to Snow White, that's an easy choice. The original is said by many to be one of the greatest Disney villains ever, with her style, grace, and love of all the villainous things that she does. The only downside is, it's only explained in narration why she doesn't like Cinderella. Because of this, it's a little harder to identify with her motivation. In the new film, we see how her bitterness is born. She hears her husband confess that he preferred the first wife more, which makes her angry towards his offspring all the more understandable. We also see her slowly lure Cinderella into the role of servant, showing how patient and manipulative she can be. The downside to that is it may make her too human by comparison. Which one is more frightening? The one whose motivations are made totally clear, or the one shrouded in mystery you're supposed to have no sorrow for? The original is so slimy and hateful, there's virtually no good in her at all. While the new one is so fragile and relatable that you can see the tragedy play out in every mean-spirited move that she makes. The original acts like someone who's in control, while the remake acts like someone who wants to be in control. I guess it's kind of like comparing Zuko with Frollo. Boy, one of them needs a breakfast cereal. One is sympathetic while the other is pure evil, both still coming off as complex and interesting. So how do we really judge which one is best? Well, I guess whichever one scares us the most is the most intimidating. Well, I guess that speech that the new one made in the dark is creepy in its own right. <laughs> uh, but the new one has the mind of a sociopath, which is very psychologically terrifying. Ah, but the new one has a more developed past, allowing her to... Okay, she wins! God, that look is scary. <laughs> Some people just can't handle a good old-fashioned death glare. You whore! Remember, I can point just as hard as you. Yeah, we seem to have unbelievable power with this, don't we? Wow! Ah! Never forget. Hey, Hyper, by any chance are you of Indian descent? No, why? metal plates in my head. The only downside is I don't know what half the words that begin with ask me. Ask me the definition of seagull. What's the definition of seagull? Stop making up words, honey! You don't get it. When you hire an assassin, you use only him for life. No, you don't understand. When you have a review already full of a ton of estrogen, hey, and the good-looking half of that estrogen is threatened, you awaken a demon that will not sleep into the night. Oh, by the way, honey, I got your hat. <gasps> Thank you so much, Wooble. No problem, babe. <laughs> Into the night. You might be good with a gun, but you're nothing compared to my stealth. Ha! I can see you coming a mile away. I was looking right at him. How did he do that? Is something wrong, Possum Bear? Nothing, Heart Eater. You and your lady friend keep talking princesses. Stop calling me that. I have to bury my bullets in the bloody body of a bastardized bitch! No! No? This one has more bullets. <sighs> I love you, Skull Crusher! I love you, Turtle Duck! Ah! Back to the
the debate. But that all sounded amazing! Critic. Okay, fine. This is best side characters. <laughs> Remembers the talking mice in the original, they're very scaled down in the remake, to the point where they don't even speak. A different tone to say the least, but everybody loves the singing mice and their. He's a sewing to the women! Slightly sexist lines. Hey, Stallone did it a sweater! But come on, who could forget Lucifer the cat? Or the horse, or the dog, the king and servants, the stepsisters? These are characters we all remember. Yes, you remember them because there's a ton of time devoted to them. Too much time. In the remake, the supporting cast stays exactly that, supportive. In the original, they hijack the movie on several occasions. While they're cute and all, they take time away from the more important elements, like the prince and the chemistry that's supposed to build between him and Cinderella. But hey, you were talking about how the king gets way too much time in the old one. He gets just as much time in the new one. Yes, but it's with the prince. Every scene with him is helping develop the prince's character even more, establishing his responsibilities, his goals, and his connection with his father. We never even see the prince and his father together in the original, apart from an eye roll. But again, it was a very passionate eye roll. I suppose the last big one to talk about is the fairy godmother. In the new one, she's played more for laughs because, well, she's Helena Bottom Carter, and that's what you do with her now. But you have to admit, some comedy is very welcomed after Cinderella is at her lowest moment. And also, she has to prove her worth by disguising herself as a homeless lady looking for water. And it's only after Cinderella gives it to her that she grants all her wishes. But isn't that kind of pointless? She has to know she's a kind person if she's showing up there. I mean, watching her like a godmother. Maybe, but have you figured this? Cinderella is in shambles. She can't go to the ball, her dress is ruined, and her family hates her. Most people in that state would be too frustrated to be nice to the old woman, so by helping someone else, even in one of her worst moments, it cements what a good person she is. I guess, but I don't know. The other one talks to her like a loving grandparent. Someone she's familiar with enough to know she would do that anyway. She has a warmth and a comfort that needs to be seen after such hardship. I wouldn't want to laugh after going through all this. I would want to feel supported. And after years of slaving for your family, suddenly being put to a test to see if you're a nice person does not seem very supportive. Okay, maybe the fairy godmother is a little better in the original. Did I mention she's a liar too? And you find that really comfortable. I got glass sneakers because of her. They hurt! But the fact still remains that the supporting cast does more than support. They take over. They steal scenes that shouldn't have to be stolen by them. While there is still focus on Cinderella and the stepmother, other important elements are being overlooked, and the new film keeps the focus where it should be. The main characters stay the main characters, and the supporting roles stay the supporting roles. I guess I can't really fault you on that. New gets the point. You forgot a heartless prince joke! Shut up! As simple as a story is, there's always room to muck it up. Trust me, Disney's done it before. This is which one mucked it up less. The funny thing about a simple story is they can be surprisingly tough to tell. You want to connect with the characters in a relatable setup, but even in an hour and a half, you have to know what to expand on and what to keep limited. Like said before, the first film expands too much on the side characters and not enough on some of the main ones. But in the new film's case, the attempts to add more detail can help some scenes but seriously damage others. For example, when Cinderella is not allowed to sit at the table with the others, it's when she realizes she's truly not a part of the family, causing her to finally break down. This is a powerful scene and all, but it then ruins the moment when her dress is destroyed. Or slightly ripped. <gasps> yeah, that's, that's a gut-wrenching moment. But even if they did like the original, it wouldn't work because we got the breakdown earlier. Because of this, the arrival of the fairy godmother is not as powerful. In the anime one, it's by far her lowest moment because they knew to save it. Thus, you feel more emotion for her and even more relief when the fairy godmother arrives. But the story does allow for other emotional moments that weren't in the first. The king, for example, is given a lot of time with his son, and when he passes away, it's a legitimately sad moment. The ways they allow Cinderella and the prince to meet before the ball are also very clever, giving them more time to form a connection. 
The problem with that is, every single time she leaves the house, it makes for a slightly less magical night when she goes to the ball. Cinderella goes to the town and quite a few other places several times in the new one. Which is fine, but in the original, everything she does is in that one location. It's a nice location, so it's not visually dull, but that's all you ever see. The story is very clever in keeping her there as not only does it emphasize the feeling of being imprisoned, but also the freedom when she does leave and enters this heavenly dream-like castle. Therefore, we're more sucked into the experience because, like her, it's our first time seeing it. Yeah, but all the wasted time with the side characters. Yeah, but all the time wasted on the unneeded exposition. But everything in the original is so obvious. And this one isn't? Gee, I wonder what the message was again. Have courage and be kind. 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 Be kind. And have courage. Fine, I guess there's both good things and bad things about them. Yeah, I guess it just depends if you're looking for more mystery or more explanation. So, what do we do in this case? Can there be a tie? A tie? That's for pussies who don't believe some animals more equal than others. There's pros and cons to both. I don't think we're going to find one that's better than the other. <sighs> Okay, I guess we can have a tie. But I'm not gonna let this choice demean my masculinity, nor anything else in the rest of this video. Johnson Justice. Holy mother of God. God knows we've talked about pretty much everything you can talk about, but there is one less element to discuss. The most important element of the movie, the main character. This is the best Cinderella. This one you know you have to give to the remake. It's like everyone says, this Cinderella is stronger, more independent, more intelligent, and more developed than that simple songbird who does practically nothing in the first film. The audiences liked her, the critics liked her, come on. This is hands down the winner. Well, I would agree with you if it wasn't for one solitary fact. What's that? You're all full of shit. What makes this Cinderella independent? Well, she leaves the house, goes into town, and has smart conversations with the prince. Hmm, so she could leave the house at any time. Why does she stay there and take all that abuse? Well, like she says, it's her father's home. Because I made my mother and father a promise to cherish the place we were so happy. Oh, is that why she ends up leaving at the end anyway? And even if it was her father's home, why go through all that hardship just for that? Well, okay, it doesn't quite make sense, but the one in the other film could leave too. Not? Really? You see, in the original, the father died when she was just a child. This gives the stepmother plenty of time to brainwash her and make her think she's supposed to feel guilty and serve her family. And seeing how she was kept in the home all that time, this indicates she doesn't know much about how the real world works. She talks to rats and birds for crying out loud! In the new one, the father dies when she's an adult. She leaves all the time. In fact, her friends, yeah, she has friends in this one, say she should leave that place. Why do you stay there when they treat you so? They loved our house, and now that they're gone, I love it for them. So this makes absolutely no sense. By attempting to make her, quote, smarter and independent, they actually opened up a ton of plot holes, making her look dumber and weaker. Okay, so she's not the brightest wand in Hogwarts, but you have to admit, she's stronger. She's not as passive as the animated one. Really? In the original, she felt stuck in her position, but she clearly didn't like it. She did get angry. She did have her breaking points. Even though she was taught over the years to be a certain way, she was still human and relatable. This one, aside from her one big breakdown, which they tried to do twice, she just kind of smiles and looks happy like a zombie most of the time. In fact, in the anime one, when it comes to being locked in the attic and held against her will, she does try to get out. She hits the door, she screams, she asks her animal friends for help. She does everything she can to get out of there. 
In the new one, she fully accepts her doom and just spins around in circles, humming to herself. Yeah, this is the strong, independent role model the critics were talking about. She actually escapes by mistake when the animals open up the window and they hear her voice. That's not strong, that's the definition of giving up while also being saved by luck. But, uh, she's so charming. No, she's not allowed to be because they're focusing more on her being smart and independent. People miss what makes a strong character is how they deal with their flaws, their fears, their turmoils, their troubles that get in the way. That's what makes them relatable. But this Cinderella doesn't have any flaws. At least, none that they'll acknowledge. You could argue she's too passive, but what does she do to solve that? Let someone else save the day and not even try! This Cinderella at least gave a shit, because while having a character be strong is good, it's more important to have them interesting first. This character is not interesting. I'm not gonna act like the original is the best written character, but you felt her pain. You understood her anger. And you cheered for her when things went right because she allowed you to see her most fragile moments. But, but, her dress! It just, it looks so amazing! And that's why you're falling for it. It looks the part and sounds the part, but it's not portraying the part. It's like the two Charlies from the Willy Wonka movies. One is an emotional yet dreamful kid, and the other is Jesus. We're obviously going to relate to the one that acts more like a real kid because we all were real kids. We can relate to that. It's the same thing here. It doesn't matter what you claim she is or isn't. If you don't connect with her, there's no emotion. And this movie has made it impossible to connect with her because they tried to make her flawless ironically creating unintentional flaws with her that are never acknowledged or resolved. But her dress! Point goes to the old. Oh, it's so sparkly! So, with everything wrapped up, let's see who the winner is. Another tie? What the hell, man? We can't end like this! Yeah, we need to find the best Cinderella movie! <laughs> Yeah-ha! Didn't expect old Johnson justice, did ya? Now open your mouth. I'm gonna give you the finishing blow. Honey Raisin, can you help us settle a dispute? Oh, there's still your little book club going on? I swear to God. We're trying to decide what's the better Cinderella film, the original or the remake. Really? You're asking me this right now? Answer the question, cartoon or remake? Yeah! The cartoon or the remake? Ever after. The Drew Barrymore movie? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's cool, it's smart, it's got sword fighting, Morticia Adams as the stepmother. Hell, even Cinderella does a little fighting. Yeah, there's no magic, but I hate that shit. I got Johnson Justice. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna finish what I start. Damn it, how does he keep doing that? Benny, what's your favorite Cinderella movie? Oh, uh, Ever After. What? The writing is clever, the characters are interesting, the villain is fun, and there's just enough changes to keep it fresh but still stay true to the heart of the story. Actually, the more I think about it, it is a really good Cinderella story. Yeah, like, really good. Cinderella is strong but interesting. The villain is evil but also intriguing. There's plenty of action and adventure. But good romance and dress porn. We should just pick that one. Are we allowed? Yeah, why not? I mean, I think everybody can agree the two Cinderella movies have pros and cons and everyone's just gonna kind of like the version they like. But Ever After is clearly better. Yeah! Let's do it! Let's give it to Ever After! You got it! The best Cinderella movie is Ever After! Because it's my show and I can do whatever the goddamn hell I want! certainly an interesting discussion, and with a twist ending. Yeah, but what do we do now? I don't know. It seems a little weird to kill a fellow Ever After fan. There's only one incredibly manly thing to do in this situation. Siri, play Ever After. Once again, the magic of Angelica Houston unites us all. Now this is how real men spend their Friday nights. Hey! Oh, don't worry, Buzzsaw, you're not a raid dude tonight. Thanks.
the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to the Disney Live Action Remake Month. La la la, la la la, la la la, la la Disney likes profitable phases, doesn't it? Don't get me wrong, some of the most timeless characters have made money for years, but they also like to focus on what's popular for the moment. Whether it be Disney Channel original movies, DVD sequels, or buying what you thought for a second wasn't theirs, they finally ask the question, what if they combine their timeless story still making money with their search for fad still making money? And with less creative effort. Hey, they had to continue those timeless stories that already made them money. What if they just told them again? Now we're cooking! The Disney live-action remakes, for the most part, have turned in a huge profit. So much so that at the time this video is released, at least 12 other Disney stories are in the process of being remade. It's like Groundhog Day, except instead of you becoming a better person, the world is becoming continually worse. And one of the earliest hits was Maleficent. <laughs> Starring Angelina Jolie, this was supposed to do for the villain of Sleeping Beauty what Wicked did for the villain of The Wizard of Oz. Hey, Disney is ripping itself off enough, why not steal from other sources? The idea of telling a fairy tale from a different point of view is nothing different, but the advertising for this movie made it look like you were going to be rooting for the bad guy. Like, oh, it feels so good to be so bad, let's root for that anti-hero! And seeing how Maleficent is easily one of Disney's best villains, this could kind of be cool. What we got is... Ow! Ow! <laughs> Not cool. Is it possible, though, that just like the lead, this is all a misunderstanding and I should look closer to find something of worth? Do all crows secretly have a cool, styling emo stud muffin inside of them? Stay cool, bird boy. Let's take a look at Maleficent. Let us tell an old story anew, and we will see how well you know it. Well, if you're telling it anew, we can't know it. The first line is literally a lie! So there's a kingdom of people and a kingdom of creatures the Navi refuse to eat, as a young Maleficent, shown here as taxidermy owl wings on an American girl doll, is one of the kindest and gentlest of all fairies. I guess they regret calling her Maleficent then. The border guards are just gonna tell her. I want to tell her. Border guards. No, you told last time, so I should tell this time and this will it next time. Fine, thank you. I hope you're laughing your ass off at this because there's 20 minutes of this joy sprinkled all throughout the film. The border, the border, guards, border guards have found a human thief at the pool of jewels. I'm sorry. For what? Delivering a bad punchline or looking like a CG Barbie dolls Barbie dolls? Christ, are those ugly? They find a farm boy named Stefan who stole a jewel from them, but Maleficent forces him to give it back. She walks him back to his kingdom where he reveals his parents are dead. My parents are dead. Mine too. My horns ripped up my mother's insides at birth, and then I headbutted my father on the way out. They agree to form a friendship over the years, and even end up loving each other. She grows up into Angelina Jolie, a fitting choice as she's a mix of beautiful and... Kinda of funny looking. But as you'll see, the writing does little to keep her an interesting character. For several years pass, and Stefan was away taking asshole lessons so he could help the king destroy the fairies because... What was the reason again? Crush them! <laughs> Makes sense. Maleficent is the protector of her kingdom with her tree beard army, and heads up, nothing in the film is cooler than the scene. Well, that was a great climax in the first 15 minutes of the film, set the rest of the flick to. <laughs> Stefan, the crown's personal Scottish Michael Bay, hears the king say whoever kills Maleficent will become the future ruler of the land. Hey, how is the old M gal anyway? Maleficent. He finds he can't actually kill her, but he decides to cut off her wings as proof. Good thing Maleficent's a heavy sleeper because she didn't even notice and she wakes up defeathered. Ah! I never even got to find out how they tasted. Stefan drops off the wings, which equals a body, I guess, and is appointed king. Maleficent says if one character can spontaneously turn into a dick, so can I, and she turns herself evil. Her first order of evil business? Turn a random crow into a boy! You monster! I need you to be my wings. What do I call you? Beaval. What do they call you? Beaval. It's not a name, that's the sound a goose makes when it farts. Beaval. So Maleficent and Beaval decide to turn their kingdom into a den of evil. 
or just make things dark, but do it look so evil and hatch the diabolical plan of sitting around and doing nothing for years. Doth your evil no no starting point? Of course, Stefan gets himself a queen who gives birth to a daughter named Aurora, and three of the other kingdom's most annoying fairies come to foster peace. I wish for you the gift of beauty. My wish is that you'll never be blue, only happy. All the days of your life. May seeing grief and sorrow in other people confuse you so you cannot comfort them. Before the last fairy can give her present though, and by the way, yes, we never figure out what it was going to be, Maleficent steps in to constantly show off that she has two rows of teeth. Stay away from the princess. Yes, stay away. Oh. I'll call you when a 90s rainforest needs patronizing. Before the sun sets on her 16th birthday, she will prick her finger on the spindle of the spinning wheel! Oh my! Actually, that's not too bad. And fall into a sleep like death! Oh, that's much worse. Actually, why don't you just make it death? Why a deep sleep that's like death? Why don't you just make it death? Wouldn't that be a lot simpler? Never! Okay, oh, yeah, your curse. And because this movie's tone also seems to be on a spinning wheel, listen to the music they play over this scene. I like you, Beggy. Do it again. Aw, yeah, she's totally cursing that baby to feel the rhythm of her swing. Oh, yeah. I beg you. All right. The princess can be woken from her death sleep, but only by true love's kiss. No! What are the chances a beautiful girl who's happy 24-7 will find someone to love her? You weirdly not practical monster! So yes, if the fairies weren't pointless enough in this, they don't even offset Maleficent's magic with true love's kiss or sleep instead of death edition. Yeah, don't you remember? That was the last gift that the fairy was supposed to give, but now there's just no gift at all. It's just Maleficent's own idiotic curse that was a lot simpler in the original. On her 16th birthday, she shall prick her finger and die. Oh, wait, 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 there's also like five loopholes I myself wanted to put in. I want to be a fair mistress of evil. To make things even dumber, it's the king's idea to give his daughter to the fairies to raise her for 16 years. Why? They in no way show they have an understanding of Maleficent's magic, and they act like bumbling dumbasses. Look at their faces. They can barely even carry this kid. One song of rock a -bye baby can turn into rock. A bye, baby! Smart! So Maleficent builds a wall around her kingdom. Don't worry, the humans will pay for it. And she reveled in the sorrow that her curse had brought. And the millions of ways it can be overturned. Like, I haven't done the math, but I'm pretty sure it's in the mills. The fairies go to a cottage where they do eventually make themselves bigger. Oh, how fake. Can we go back to the realistic looking CGI bodies? And as expected, they turn out to be pretty shitty parents. Right down to leaving her outside to be spotted, and Maleficent finding them literally before they can even move in. Oh, there goes all that suspense. Oh, wait, I take it back. There actually is a lot of suspense. Suspense that these three lobotomized Hocus Pocus stooges will kill the child before Maleficent dies. In fact, Maleficent saves Aurora from their benign child slaughtering ways and even ends up raising her more than the fairies do. I'm not even joking. That's what happens over all these years. Look, I'm open to a different interpretation, but the fairies in the original were clumsy, but loving and caring and charming. These three literally let the baby almost die on several occasions and sleep through half of it and fight through the other half. They're despicably unlikable. In fact, they're easier to hate than the character you're supposed to hate. Actually, yeah, let's talk about her for a bit. It's clear what Disney's trying to do. They're trying to go the wicked route of taking a famous villain with no sympathy and making her a misunderstood hero. But here's the thing, the original Wicked Witch from The Wizard of Oz is a thug. She's a simpleton with a low vocabulary who uses blunt force to get whatever she wants. There's supposed to be no charm to her. So in Wicked, it's compelling when you see her as the opposite. A smart, fragile, charismatic, yet misunderstood outcast who got blamed for everything because she was different. And didn't always know how to fight back. You can easily see how this world would make up a story about her being this villain. 
With Sleeping Beauty, Maleficent is already a charming, charismatic, and sophisticated villain. She has her outbursts, of course, but there's always a charm and grace to whatever she does. You love how smart, elegant, and diabolical she can be. So to make this work, you would have to do the opposite. And A, I'm not sure that's what this movie does, and B, if it does, it doesn't do it well. She's not simple enough to have a charming naivete, but she's also not intelligent enough to be diabolical or menacing. Her actions half the time are pulling pranks on the fairies or trying to scare the baby with faces. And when it doesn't work, she says, I hate you. Like a fifth grader. So on no level does this come together. It can't go all the way with what it originally was, but it can't go all the way with the opposite either. She's the badass mistress of all e Oh, she looks so cute when a kid hugs her! I'm so behind her being a badass villain, except when they're trying to make her a cute, awkward babysitter. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Mistress of all evil? How about mistress of just stopping Home Alone sequels in her spare time? Though that would be a welcome gift. years pass, Aurora, now played by Ellie Fanning, grows older and, wouldn't you know it, Maleficent and her grow a close friendship. Again, this film really gives us exactly what we want from a Maleficent movie. I know who you are. Do you? You're my fairy godmother. To be fair, I'd rather have her than Helena Bonham Carter. So she visits Maleficent every night and they just hang out, throw mud at each other, have girl talk, express their feelings, again. Exactly what you would want from a Maleficent movie. Did I mention in the upcoming Frollo film that him and Quasimodo go bowling? It's very sweet and totally understands the character. In fact, she gets along so well with Aurora that she even tries lifting the curse, but she finds she can't. Yeah, apparently even she doesn't know what the hell her powers can do. There is an evil in this world. I can take care of myself. I frolicked and smiled like nobody's business. I'm very self-reliant. Lucky, lucky though, a young prince named Philip is wandering through the forest and comes across Aurora. It's love at first. Goodbye. The small talk. Hey, it's still more dialogue than they had in the original film. Thus Maleficent and Beava discuss if the prince can break the spell. True love's kiss, remember? It can break the spell. True love's kiss. I curse her that way because there is no such thing. It's a very abstract, open-to-interpretation spell. So on the eve of her 16th birthday, Aurora tells the fairies that she's leaving them. Way to add to the mood. And they accidentally blurt out who she really is. We are taking you back to your father. You told me my parents were dead. It's almost like you're awful, 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 awful people! Aurora clarifies this with her real parent, Maleficent. Did you hear how stupid that sounded? That's the story! And she also discovers that Maleficent is the one who cursed her. Don't touch me. You're the evil that's in the world. No, actually, that's the good version, but this one is at least... dumb. She makes her way to her real father, who has slowly been growing insane over the years, resulting in his voice sounding even sillier than it did before. You look just like your mother. I told those three idiots. They brought you back a day too soon. Lock her up in her room. Did they replace him with a shrinking Scrooge McDuck? How am I supposed to be intimidated by that voice? Maleficent thinks the prince's kiss might work, so she knocks him out and tries taking him to the palace where Aurora is. She of course pricks her finger and goes into a deep sleep, throwing her father's voice into a gargling rage. Look at her. Look at what you've done. She's only sleeping. Oh my god, have they invented pesticide yet? Where's your bedside manners? She's only sleeping. She's only sleeping forever! David Tennant sucking helium balloons would sound more intimidating than this guy. The prince tries kissing her, but it doesn't work. So Maleficent goes in and... Don't get too excited. It's the frozen logic, the love for a family member over a romantic love, and since the spell already has enough fine print, it counts. However, the crazy old white dude reveals he's the villain and not the scary looking green lady. Because again, if we're not gonna tell this story, we might as well tell this one. And the guards entrap her, but she turns blah, 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 into a dragon. I feel like there's several instances where that could have come in handy. I need you to be my wings. Turn yourself into something with wings. Like in the original! And Aurora breaks open Maleficent's wings that fly directly to her. 
Yay, it's Sleeping Beauty teamed up with Maleficent to fight an old crazy guy! Yeah, sorry, no part of that is cooler than this. It's not even an acknowledgement to their past relationship or the years of love that they shared. She just tosses him over and it's done. You kind of even forgot they were in love, it's such a meaningless connection they have. But at least a scene later, it's revealed that Aurora is now queen of both kingdoms. All those years of giggling and twirling in her dress will no doubt lead to a strong government. So you see, the story is not quite as you were told. Even though Disney told me the first version I ever heard! And I liked it a lot better! And I should know, for I was the one they called Sleeping Beauty. I've been smoking a lot, that's why my pitch is a little off. My kingdom was united not by a hero or a villain, but by one who was both hero and villain. So that way, nobody is happy. Yay! Ugh, so that is one of the greatest Disney villains of all time. Doesn't it show? I'll admit it does look very nice, even though the effects can be very fake, it's still shot quite beautifully and gives us some nice visual landscapes. But this movie is an insult to one of Disney's greatest characters. We don't want to see Maleficent as a hero, we love her fine as a villain. If you want to make her more complex, fine, but don't tell us deep down she's a good person. That's not what we're looking for. Some villains are so good we enjoy hating them, like the Joker or Freddy Krueger or any number of the Disney baddies. Trying to be both bad and good ruins what we appreciate about this kind of character to begin with, that she did go all the way. There's definitely great villains that can explore the good and the bad, but this shouldn't be one of them. This movie needed to pick a side, a tone, and an idea to stick with. Instead, it just sucks out the evil fun that made our happily ever after all the more happier. And it's a spell I'm not gonna fall for. And I'll tell you what, I'm avoiding the movies of this writer. I mean, it's not like this person wrote any other live-action Disney film. It's the next one, isn't it? Damn it! I know I left it in here somewhere. Ah, here we go. The original classic. You know, when did Tim Burton and Giant Depp become the people you call to tone down the imagination? Critic! Malice? We need your help right away. Oh my god, tell me all about it! So there's great trouble brewing in- Twat. <sighs> oh. Don't make me go curious on your ass. Oh come on, Malice, I know I'm doing a Disney live-action remake month, but they didn't even do an animated Through the Looking Glass movie! Yes, but the animated Alice in Wonderland looks more like Through the Looking Glass than the live-action Through the Looking Glass. Sadly true. Besides, a lot has changed. Tim Burton's gone. Everything's more bright and colorful. Even Johnny Depp's better. Really? All that happened? It's only two out of those three things, yes. <sighs> All right, how do I get there? Do I eat something or go through a magical door? No, we use this technologically advanced time machine to go wherever we'd like. Gee, how magical. Well, what do you think? I think this might actually work. I just can't get over how beautiful everything looks. I mean, it's bright, it's colorful. <laughs> Surreal. I mean, dare I say it, there's a sense of wonder here. Good, I didn't want to have to cut off your balls and feed them to my wildebeest. It sounds like you did. I did, but I won't. Yeah, that's progress. So, remind me again what the urgent matter is. Carrot juice is sad. And? His entire family died in a fire. Recently? No, long ago. And we have to stake our entire world upon making him happy again. Okay, look, it sucks that he's sad. Really sucks. But it happens. People cope. No, we have to go back in time to cause his family's death. Huh? As well as causing every horrible thing that's ever happened in our world. What? While trying to learn a lesson about not being able to change the past, but being rewarded for changing the past. Repeat of previous what? It's mad. 
Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Yeah, but there's a difference between mad and dumb. Mad is being concerned that a pocket watch is two days slow or everybody's cheating to win a race that everybody wins. Dumb is trying to take those simple, charming ideas and turn it into a big action end of the world thriller. But I'm sad. I don't care that you're sad. If anything, it pisses me off that all our problems are centered around a dumb, moping jackass. Bunny. Asshole is what you are. Well, you're obviously no help. Come on, carrot juice. Let's go back in time and almost cause the end of the world to perk you up. Here. Yeah, that's pretty much what happens. La 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 The sequel to the unfortunate live-action hit, Alice in Wonderland, happily didn't win over audiences or critics. On the one hand, it's very easy to see why. It's continuing its lame attempt at making Wonderland, oh sorry, Underland, however did I confuse those two, into a rebellious action-packed resistance movie. Like its predecessor, it has virtually nothing to do with the Lewis Carroll books, but to its credit, it does actually have seeds of what Alice in Wonderland was. Okay, there's seeds growing under a brick house of dumb, but there's still seeds. Is it a shame, then, that this one made less money despite it having more elements from the books than the original? Or is this series just getting, inevitably, what it deserves? Let's take a closer look. This is Alice Through the Looking Glass. Surrendering my father's ship. Okay, when I said there's elements of the original, I didn't mean right away. Yeah, Alice is the captain of her own ship now, and she's about as commanding as Keira Knightley leading pirates. Between the two of them, I don't think they could lead a school of fish. Hard to port, Harper! I'll give credit to Alice, played again by Mia Wojcikowska. There is at least a little investment in her performance. Though granted, after the last film, an aggressive blink would be welcomed at this point. That's enough chatter. Whoa, tone down there, Daniel Day-Lewis! But she doesn't have much to work off of, as, once again, she plays the ahead-of-her-time outsider who must prove she's tough and independent before proving she's interesting or has a personality. Hell, the cliched, pompous, uppity cocks have more personality if you really think about it. No other company is in the business of hiring female clocks, let alone ship's captains. <laughs> 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 my teeth can't get any bigger, but my monocle certainly can! <laughs> there will be no further expeditions. You will start in files, but in time... My transition of Billy Zane rogering a fat is almost complete. Well, my transition into the NBC Peacock is almost complete. Let's just agree we're sillier than anything we're going to see in Wonderland. Wonderland. Oh, yes, stupid movies. Your father set those shares aside for me. He gave them to your mother, who sold them to me a year ago while you were gone, along with the bond on the house. House bond, stock shares, company ownership. Alice in Wonderland, everybody! At this point in the original book, she just got done talking with flowers and met the queen on a giant chessboard. But the hell with that shit. Here she's wondering whether or not she wants to sign over her father's ship to save her mother's house. Oh. But it's in a garden. That's kind of the same thing. Sea Captain is no job for a lady. You can't just make things however you want them to be. Clearly you've never met the writers of these movies. We do eventually get to... <sighs> Underland. As the caterpillar, now a butterfly, leads her to the looking glass where she crosses over. Look, someone's in there. Who's in there? Who's in there? Oh no, the guests are trying to get in through the locked door. Hurry, Alice, before... They get in and ask what's going on. Why is this urgent? Believe it or not, we actually do partake in some Wonderland-ish material, knocking over Humpty Dumpty, bickering with chess pieces, doors leading to the sky. So this is what Alice in Wonderland could have been. Oh, bullshit plot ho! What's the matter? The Hatter's the matter. He's grown darker, denies himself laughter. And no scheme of ours can raise any sort of smile. Yep, the Mad Hatter is feeling sad because he came across a blue hat that reminded him of his family killed by the Queen of Hearts. Not sure why Alice was brought in to deal with this. Maybe her slight sense of acting direction can set off Depp's complete lack of acting direction. I found this. So if this hat survived, my family must have too. Yeah, if Depp's hatter acting in the first one was the equivalent of his Fantastic Beast performance, then this one is definitely his Mordecai performance. I never said I was sorry when I had the child. It's like his Willy Wonka was too drunk to find a job, so he became the local Ronald McDonald. He looks beyond lost. 
You are not you. There's a hole in the world like a great black pit, and it's from this movie that's full of shit. So, because I know you're all invested, why don't you remind us of the plot again, Alice? Fine times cast will borrow the chronosphere, travel back in time to Horror and Vendor's Day, save the Hatter's family from being killed, and thereby save the Hatter. And then get McFly to kiss at the prom so my picture will come back. And if your past self sees your future self, everything would be history. That really doesn't sound worth the risk. I mean, I like the Mad Hatter. Actually, I don't even like him. But even if I did, it's not worth risking the entire friggin' world. You know, because it's the entire friggin' world. How's this counting on you? We all are. Why? You really are making a mountain out of one of these. He's depressed. Sucks. Grab him some Prozac, get him laid, and show him some fresh Prince of Bel-Air, minus this episode. The end of the world does not need to factor into this. She goes to the center of time, as she's the only one who can do it because she's not from around there. Oh, those restrictive rules that limit the imagination of Wonderland. Oh, sorry, Underland. She also discovers that time is a he, played by Sacha Baron Cohen. Who is there? I saw you. How did you get in? It is impossible. Really? It was a literal hop and a skip. I don't see where the impossible comes in. Despite not being in the books, this character does surprisingly bring a similar charming goofiness that would probably be found in them. And it's actually refreshing to hear ideas and wordplay centered around time being explored. Everyone parts with everything eventually. These minuscule artisans are my seconds. Thank you for your you, sir. If Alice came across time in the books, I feel like this is probably how it would go. You see, the Jabberwock just killed his family on the Horn Vendor's Day, and I killed the Jabberwock on the Fratch's Day, and I'd like your permission if you please to borrow the Chronosphere to compare uh. But again, it doesn't last long. For guess who shows up again? No, really, they want you to guess before they reveal her. Shall I announce you? No, no, my I'll announce myself. Who could it be? A performer who used to be subtle but gave it up for screaming and crazy hair. The other one. There you go. Oh my god, can we get that fast forward thing back from earlier? These are the parts that really need it! It looks like time has fallen in love with the abusive Queen of Hearts, played again by Helena bottoming out Carter, as it looks like she still has it in her contract to have the camera two inches away from her at all times. I could get even with my sister, and we could fall the past, the present. Okay, you look like Pennywise about to French me. Please stop confusing the camera for your toothbrush! Alice decides to take control of the Chronosphere to go back in time to save Hatter's family, but not before battling Time's minions. I have to stop this from turning into a Les Mis reunion. I can't hear Russell Crowe sing again! She must have the Chronosphere. All our hopes fly with you. Hi, critic. Just a heads up, the time traveling is going great, but the world may accidentally go to shit though. Like how, it's gonna blow up or something? No, literally turn to shit. We will all become turds. But at least Carrot Juice will be happy again. Yeah. Yeah, weird thing, it's hard to get invested over a character we barely see. There's not really much of an emotional connection to justify the end of the world, you know? Don't listen to him, Carrot Juice. You've got a ton of personality that we're exploring. Well, I... Shut up, I'm talking. Oh. The world will be so happy to see you happy again, or we'll die trying as well as the world. Yes, I said we. Ooh, she's having cake with a lion and a unicorn now. So Alice travels to when the Hatter and his family made the crowns of the White Queen and the Queen of Hearts. Only princesses, then. It looks like the crown doesn't fit the giant head, though, causing the crowd to laugh. <laughs> you know, for being Hatters, they really suck at it. Didn't they prepare for this? Put a bag on her head. <laughs> okay. A princess! Enough! But I was going to say my trademark thing! It was going to be a big deal, and I'm not sure why it being interrupted is still trying to make it a big deal! You are unfit to rule, Erasmus. She loses the crown and vows vengeance on the Hatters. Wouldn't it make more sense to vow vengeance on the lady that made fun of her? And the Hatter's father balls him out. All I did was laugh, father. Why am I never good enough for you? Why is you always such a disappointment? 
You will believe a character you don't give a shit about is trying to make you give a shit about him. Alice tells the Hatter about how his family is going to get killed, but he doesn't care. So she tries to tell the family, but they're in the middle of fighting off incredibly forced exposition. All of Whitsend laments the day of your sister's accident. As the clock struck six, I shall never forget that snowy night when she hit her head in the town square. That moment changed everything. Get in? Got it. Good. So she goes to try and stop the Queen of Hearts from hitting her head, while Time tries to follow her, but comes across the Hatter during his tea party. Again, in all honesty, this scene has a real legit Alice in Wonderland feel. It's different levels of insanity trying to relate to each other and getting nowhere. And it's actually clever as well as entertaining. Is it true that you heal all wounds? Time is on my side. I have always wondered when soon is. If you vex me, it will be. Eternity. But even that's botched in an attempt to throw a kind of twist in there. And until the young Alice joins you for tea, it will always remain one minute till tea time for you and your underheads. You get it? So when Alice showed up in the first film, she was actually freeing them. That's why they were at that table the whole time. Why is that supposed to be fun? Wasn't it crazier or even mad that they were just sitting there the whole time because they wanted to? Nobody said, oh, I really want it so that they're prisoners there. They just wanted them to be in their own little world because it's enjoyable. Again, you're trying to add logic in something that doesn't need it. The series really is like the villain from Care Bears in Wonderland, trying to add logic and order to a world that shouldn't have any. Except in that, he's the bad guy. Here, it's just Disney! And that's still the better adaptation, by the way! Alice travels to the Hatter's childhood, and if you think him as an adult was boring and awkward... You have a very nice head, and a nice head deserves a very nice hat. That's what my father says. Would you like him to make you one? Isn't this just what you imagined with the Mad Hatter as a little kid? Imagine the animated one as a child bouncing off the walls, or the Martin Short one acting like a wild animal, and this one! As bland as that kid who gets axed off in Revenge of the Sith. You have a very nice head. There are too many of them. What are we going to do? And despite this not being directed by Tim Burton, it still somehow has the exact same shitty backstory as his Willy Wonka remake. The function of a hat is to follow the proper dictum of society. Not to be fun. Hatting is a serious business. Why can't my limiting ideas get through to your slightly less limiting ideas? Despite having two attempts to tell the family how to avoid getting murdered, Alice once again neglects to so she can stop the Queen of Hearts from hitting her head. Which it turns out is because her sister stole a tart and blamed her. Did you eat the tart and put the crust there? No, but you did, you're lying! No, it's not fair! It's not fair! Next she'll be telling me she ate Marceline's fries. Alice tries stopping the accident, but she only ends up causing it, starting her head turning huge. You cannot change the past. She realizes now that she can't change time and it was wrong to meddle with it. But she also realizes that the Hatter's family is still alive. Go meddling! Always the answer! <laughs> time catches up with Alice though and she observes they slowly die. And the end of the world will take place if the Chronosphere is not returned. So naturally Alice looks into her heart and I must say that. tells him to piss off. Alice! Alice! She is literally looking at a dying man, and the end of the goddamn world is upon us, but... The Hatter is sad! <laughs> she is so freaking crazy, she belongs in a mental institution. Where am I? You are in an institution. Well, I'm glad you agree with me, movie, but... Huh? Okay, so apparently she passed out when she traveled through the looking glass, and they took her to a mental ward. Textbook case of female hysteria. Untreatable, some say. Okay, what are they gonna do with this? Well, she escapes. Three years at sea taught me anything. It's how to tie a bloody good knot. Why thanks, me. It was important to remind me of that, me. And she goes back through the looking glass. <laughs> that whole thing lasted three minutes. Why the hell did we have that detour? <laughs> Oh, hi, Critic. I just wanted to give you some incredibly important information that we were delayed for just a moment. But we're back on track. And he's still sad. Go. Just go. But he's still sad. Leave. But leave. Okay. Right. 
As if Depp couldn't get any whiter, apparently thinking his parents are dead is killing him. Can't tell if he's dying of a broken heart or a broken career. I should have believed you. You wouldn't believe me. Your Alice. Uh, never your Alice again. I'm putting you on a watch list. Hatter suddenly gets better hearing the news that his family is alive and that the Queen of Hearts most likely has them. I'm going to find that Red Queen and bring my family home. That is such a Hatter thing to say. God, he's such a well-defined character. So they all try breaking into the Queen's hideout? I don't really know what it is. Where they find his family is in an ant farm. Everyone, it's you. Hi, Dad! Been waiting a long time for this. But they all get caught because even though Alice verbally clarified the importance of tying knots, she forgot to verbally clarify the importance of bringing weapons to a battle. What kind of a dumbass captain are you? The Queen takes control of time and his machine to travel back with her sister. Oh, this is all my fault. No, no, all of it. But the guards decide they don't like the Queen and let our heroes go. Why the hell didn't you betray her when she was still there? as the queen takes her sister to the tart moment so she can finally confess her lie. She put them there. Did you, Morana? Did you? No. So the moral is, everyone's a terrible person. It's the Seinfeld finale of fantasies. But the film follows time cop logic as the queen sees herself, which somehow starts freezing over the entire world. <laughs> So just a reminder, you can't change the past, except when you can totally, absolutely change the past. Don't seem to recall her opening the door and freezing the world the first time she stole the tarts. But the Hatter was sad. They try to get the chronosphere back where it belongs as everyone starts crusting over. Goodbye, brother. Brother, goodbye. I have cherished every moment with all of you. Gentlemen, it has been a privilege playing with you tonight. Alice, of course, gets it back in time as the world is just barely saved and the White Queen finally confesses her fault. I ate the tarts and I lied about it. I should have just told the truth and none of this would have ever happened. I'm so sorry. That's all I ever wanted to hear. Aw, oh, that's just great. Hey, remember all those decapitated heads in the first film? It's okay, because she forgave her for the tart. Hey, remember that frog that was taken away from his family and executed? It's okay, because she forgave her for the tart. Remember the mass genocide, oppression, and countless lives destroyed because of every single one of these dumbass idiots? Tart! It was all down to Tart. I think the real question is not who's the real villain, but who isn't the real villain? So yeah, things are okay, apart from the countless graves, as Alice goes home to see her mother signing the deed to her ship. Mr. Harcourt, time is money. I'm afraid he most certainly is not. Where did you come from? I walked right through the walls. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> arrest her. She escaped from a mental institution. Bye! I may not be able to change the past, but I can learn from it. We're... we're not doing that? You want me to sign them? It's just a ship. There's always another. We had that whole scene in the movie, we're just going to ignore it? But you were my mother, and I only have one. Okay, I guess straitjackets are useless over the power of learning lessons? I knew that you would, headstrong or not. You're not a nice man, Hamish. Ooh, that one hurt. So they don't sign over the ship, and Alice's mother instead decides to give up her home to go sailing with her daughter. Time and tide wait for no man, Mr. Harcourt. Or indeed, woman. News to the Orthodox! Okay, so that was awful. Like, really awful. Like, really awful. Like, really awful. Really awful. But I have to admit, I didn't dislike it as much as the first one. The first one had virtually no elements of Wonderland at all, apart from maybe a little bit of the look. This one at least tapped into some moments. The majority of Time's character was both clever and charming. Scenes with the chessboard and tea party felt more whimsically surreal and fun, like in the original book. And the overall visual style is quite impressive, even better than the first. 
Aside from that, though, it still doesn't get across what makes Alice in Wonderland a timeless story. It still adds too many rules, too many limitations, and too many attempts to make it a big, thrilling adventure when a small, abstract story is more than enough. Both of these Alice films are bad, but I can surprisingly stomach this one a little more for the few good moments it had. On the whole, though, it's still an oyster gone bad. Okay, and I'm done. I'm gonna go home and watch the good Alice in Wonderland movie. Oh, you got happy again, huh? We ruined the lives of God knows how many countries along the way, but I'm happy once more. And what made you so ecstatic? Well, the fact that your Alice in Wonderland doesn't exist anymore. What are you talking about? I got a copy of it right here. Ah! It's shit! That's right, Critic. That's all we've done to your Alice in Wonderland. We've turned it into shit. Now when people see Alice in Wonderland, they won't see the animated one. All they'll see is shit, shit, shit. Pay attention and recite your lesson. Oh, God! Time traveling and the Mad Hatter's a dramatic character and the end of the world because of a tart! Alice, what in the flaming ass are you talking about? Oh, I'm sorry, but you see, Tim Burton said. Tim Burton? No one's going to remember his later films. Half of them are flops, even the ones he produced. Oh, then I guess, like me, people are waking up and seeing the stories that really last. Whatever. Come now, it's time for Duck Dynasty. But this world was called Underland. That sounds stupid. And it had a breakdancing Mad Hatter. You're talking like a moron. And there was a lot of discussion about home ownership. Shut up now. And I was in a mental institution. Well, that I'd believe. And we killed God knows how many people just to make an awkward actor happy. I swear to Jesus, Alice, I will strangle you with my bonnet if you don't stop your goddamn yapping. <laughs> the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. It may surprise some of you that I'm actually a huge fan of The Jungle Book. No, no, not that one. No, no, not that one either. The actual book. It's surprising how many people don't know there's a literary source to The Jungle Book. The classic collection of stories by Rudyard Kipling mostly tackle the ongoing separations yet parallels between abandonment and fostering, law and freedom, and the coming of age balance between trying to belong yet also trying to stand out. Then this came along and it became the Funny Monkey Movie! And before you go nuts, I like this film fine. The animated Disney adaptation had little connection to the best known story from the Jungle Book, Mowgli's Brothers, but it was a cute little flick with some catchy songs and memorable characters. And seeing how we're still in the middle of Disney's live action remake month. La 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 It only figures to talk about. I'll just say it, what I think is a weirdly beloved modern version. So while most of these Disney remakes are big hits, there's usually a fair amount of people who find they can't get into what the movie is doing. Jungle Book is one of the few exceptions. Sitting at 95% on Rotten Tomatoes and getting a reputation as the grown-up version compared to the other ones, only a complete asshole would dare bam out that Oh, I thought this day would never come! Yeah, I'm that jerk off who not only didn't like it, but really didn't like it. Surprisingly, it's not because it wasn't enough like the book. The original film did that and it was fine. It's that it tries to mix the book and the movie by focusing on their least effective elements while leaving out what made the other version so memorable. What are these elements? Well, as your designated asshole, I'm excited to expand on this different point of view among a sea of disapproving comments. That's a good start. Let's take a look at 2016's Jungle Book. So at first, you might be wondering why the logo looks nostalgically hand-drawn even though this is live action. Especially when there's already a nostalgically hand-drawn logo they're not using. This is the confusing tone that'll accompany the next 90 minutes. 
Oh, whoops, we skip forward to the middle. No, wait, this is apparently clever. Okay, just starting us off in the middle of things. I guess a lot of stories do that. Let's see what it adds. You must be the very worst wolf I've ever seen. A weak-ass fake-out we all saw coming. Anything else? Wolves don't hide in trees. I just picked the wrong tree. It was a dead tree. I'm gonna take this talk about trees as no, there is nothing else. So why do we have this generic intro? The opening to both the book and the animated film are simple, straightforward, and reveal a lot of character. Within the first few moments, we know Mowgli is an abandoned baby, a predator has the chance to kill him but doesn't, creates a connection showing love and care, and shows clearly that this is unusual and even risky, yet they still take that chance on this connection. But hell with that nonsense, we have the opening to U.S. Marshals! Yeah, remember that sequel to The Fugitive you don't remember? They start off with a bland action sequence with the main character that doesn't tie into the rest of the movie. A lot of shitty films do that, but to be fair, they don't already have a perfectly written intro laid out for them. And I know, it seems like a lot to harp on so early, but the other intros really do suck you in. It shows you who they are, how they became this way, and how their world works. This one, rather than showing you, tells you. When I found him many years ago, he was just an infant abandoned in the woods. That's why I entrusted him to the wolves. The book had a lot of explaining about its environment too, but it was done through Mowgli's eyes as the newcomer. If he didn't follow these rules, he'll die. We're emotionally invested. Here it sounds like what you study for a test. Arkeela was a just and noble leader, and a water truce was called. It was Raksha who raised him. It had been many, many years since the peace rock was revealed. By law of the jungle, drinking comes before eating. Critic, how does the law of the jungle go? Oh, um, I pledge allegiance. See me after class. After class yeah. By the way, see if you can tell which lines are from one of the greatest literary minds who ever lived, and which ones are Disney writers trying to make their five-year-old laugh. The law run is over and back. For the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. There's a rock. That's my rock, that's my rock. Nobody touches my rock, there's another rock. The wolf that keeps it may prosper, but the wolf that breaks it will die. Weird, 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 that's weird. Pretty hard to tell, right? At least the other one didn't even try. They knew that lines like this. I do not call you my brothers anymore, but dogs! I see that you are indeed dogs! When mixed with lines like this. They were saving the more grown-up version for the sequel. Mowgli, played by Neil Sethi, forms a strong friendship with Bagheera, voiced by Ben Kingsley. And to their credit, everybody in this film acts fine. Even ones chosen to act bad are surprisingly pretty good, but we'll get to that in a bit. The technology is very impressive too, as it truly is hard to believe that all of this takes place inside a studio. But the characters and world building are still very strange. For example, Shere Khan, voiced by Idris Elba, comes to drink from the water on the Day of Peace. It makes a little sense and isn't from the book, but I'll give it a pass for at least trying to sound adult. A man cub becomes man, and man is forbidden! This Shere Khan is... odd. In the original story, he's a screaming, bloodthirsty thug, but still follow the laws of the jungle. In the anime one, he's calm and sophisticated, but does whatever he wants for the thrill of it. Here, they try to combine the two, and... It just doesn't add up! He has an elegant vocabulary, but he's always dirty and covered in mud. Imagine if the anime one looked like that, he'd look ridiculous. You're trying my patience. He also goes on and on about following the law of the jungle, and that Mowgli should be killed because man is too dangerous, but... We'll get to that in a moment, just remember I said that. For now, there's concern about whether or not the law abiding Shere Khan will not harm Mowgli. It was a question the council had to face. They deliberated and they argued for many days. It was more interesting when they showed this discussion, but school's not supposed to be fun. I'm leaving. No matter where you go, or what they may call you, you will always be my son. Feel free to return to share our incredible moments, like hearing Bagheera talk about our incredible moments. So Mowgli agrees to leave to keep the wolves safe, but Bagheera says he's going to take him to the man village, which Mowgli doesn't want to go to. Shere Khan separates them, though, as Mowgli tries hiding among the wildebeest stampede. Hmm, I saw another Disney film like this. Doesn't end well for the cat. <laughs> Mowgli gets away, though, which should make Shere Khan happy, seeing how he's finally out of the jungle. But he returns to the wolves and, well, kills their leader and holds them hostage until Mowgli returns. Until I have the man-cub, these hills 
on my heels. Okay, this brings me back to what I was saying before. Now, this might sound like a dumb question at first, but really think about it. Like, actually think it over. Why does Shere Khan want Mowgli? In the originals, because he lives among them. Makes sense, he thinks he's gonna grow into a man and kill them. In the anime one, is for the thrill of the hunt. He loves the challenge and smiles whenever he even hears the mention of man. I'm going to close my eyes and count to ten. It makes the chase more interesting for me. Here? I don't really know. If he can do whatever he wants, like in the anime one, why didn't he just get Mowgli at the watering hole? Nobody's stopping him from taking over the wolves, so nobody would stop him there. If he follows the rules like in the book, he just threw those out the window when he killed the wolves' leader. And it doesn't matter, because Mowgli's out of the jungle anyway, there's no threat. Either way, there's no reason for him to want this damn kid, not in character motivation or logical survival. I know they're trying to be the grown-up version, but when the adult version can't answer why and the kid version can, you're pretty much becoming DC. But don't worry, their version of Ka is sure to win you over. Yeah, you remember him? Arguably pointless, but so much fun to watch you wouldn't dream of filming a Jungle Book movie without him. He was funny, but also had a predatory creepiness to him. Think Winnie the Pooh crossed with Herbert from Family Guy. You don't want me to look at you? I know what you're trying to do. He had two lengthy scenes in the anime one, so let's see what they do of him here. Well, first of all, he's a she now, played by Scarlett Johansson. Poor sweet little cub. Okay, odd, but I'll see where they're going with this. She, for no reason I can figure, tells him that Shere Khan killed his father, then tries to eat him, but is knocked out by Baloo the Bear. And that's it, no more Ka. Under two minutes of no jokes, no songs, not even really any character. But man, does she use those plot points for hypnotizing people that leave no impression on our main character. Like, he doesn't even bring up, oh, it sucks that Shere Khan killed my dad. And it looks like he just forgets about it through most of the movie. So. Which one is really better, the silly little kid version that no one remembers, or the super complex, dark and gritty grown-up version? What the hell are you people? Oh, by the way, is that the motivation for why Shere Khan wants Mowgli so bad? He wants to go after the offspring of the man who burned his face? Well, he already killed the guy. I don't see what going after the offspring's gonna do. Is he also gonna say screw the law of the jungle in my livelihood because I didn't get the son of an antelope? Or the daughter of a quail? Or the nephew of a zebra? This is still dumb if this is it! <laughs> Relax, kid. No need to get worked up, okay? So Bill Murray plays Bill Murray, voicing a bear playing Bill Murray. You owe me, kid. You owe me. I guess his distinct voice can be a little distracting, but if you never heard Little John when watching the original, you are lying to your soul. As payback for saving Mowgli's life, Baloo uses him to climb up a mountain to get him honey, telling him the bees don't sting. You said they didn't sting. What do you call this? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. I have to go to the man village. So Mowgli decides to head to the man village. Yeah, I guess he's okay with going there again. And Baloo says he'll show him the way. You can always tell by the red flower. The red flower doesn't seem so bad. Yeah. Let it loose, and it destroys everything it touches. Kind of weird how he calls fire the red flower, but a moment earlier he used the word propaganda. That's not a song. That's propaganda. Guess they got a lot of Michael Moore movies in the jungle. convinces Mowgli to stay with him in the jungle as they sing a familiar tune. What's that? That's a song about the good life. Yeah, the other version they were on song three, but I guess this is a good time to do our first. Bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. I do like that Mowgli puts devices together to help get food. It actually makes me realize how pretty useless he was in the anime one. He even finds an elephant trapped in a hole and uses his ingenuity to get him out. It's actually a very nice scene. But it's botched when Bagheera finds them both and tries to take Mowgli back to the man village. You see, when he tells Baloo that Shere Khan is after him, Baloo, for no friggin' reason, lies to Mowgli about why he has to go. Maybe it's time for you to mosey along. We're buddies, aren't we? No, we were never friends. I, mean, I certainly never thought of you as my friend. Do I have to spell this out? I don't want you around anymore. Okay, look, this scene in the anime one is kind of lame too, because Mowgli's just being a brat. But Baloo still tells him the truth. And it's Mowgli's constant fear of the man village that drives him away. In this version, Baloo convinces him to stay in the jungle. Mowgli was actually gonna go to the man village even without Bagheera. So why the hell doesn't he just be honest? 
Go to the village or Shere Khan will kill the shit out of you. He already knows how dangerous he is. In the original, he's never seen him before, but here, he got attacked by him several times. So yeah, go to the man village. Come visit. We'll hang out, just like the original plan we had. If it turns out to not be fun for you, I will walk you right down to that man village myself. Just till winter. There is no goddamn reason for this pitifully forced friendship breakup. It's lazy. It's done in a million movies to create a third act rift, and it's lazy. The book didn't need him lying, the anime one didn't need him lying, but this one does because it's the grown-up version. Hey, you know what's grown up? Treating kids with respect and being creative in what you teach them. You lazy assholes! Okay, so what characters haven't made an appearance yet? <laughs> Monkey! That's right, monkeys kidnap Mowgli and take him to a temple where King Louie, voiced by Christopher, you bet your ass they made this joke walking, resides. Who, in all fairness, is actually kind of good. I'm not even kidding, it's a totally different tone and attitude, but it kind of works. You, Manco, you come from the south, the north, what, what part? The south, I guess. You know who I am? I am the king of the Badalag. He's kind of like a mafia boss, soft-spoken but intimidating. He's threatening, but also weirdly engaging. You want to live here? You need a people to protect you. But just when you think this is something untainted by stupid... Now don't try to kid me, man cub. I'll make a deal with you. Oh my god, is this happening? I desire this man's red fire to make my dream come true. You don't have to do this. Now give me the secret, man cub. Come on! Tell me what to do. Get out! Get out of there! Of man's red flower, so I can be like you. Oh, oh, we do. No! I'm gonna be like you. Okay, so you might be thinking, come on, the song was in the animated one, why not here? Because there is no other point in the movie that's a friggin' musical! Bare Necessities is a song, but not a musical number. It's a tune Baloo teaches Mowgli and they sing it together. This song is being used to speak and communicate. It's replacing conversation and expressing motivation. And it's the only one like it in the movie. It's like at the end of Full Metal Jacket when they sing Mickey Mouse Club. They're just singing a song they all know after battle. It makes sense. But if the drill sergeant broke out singing Let It Go and everybody joined him, it'd be friggin' goddamn ludicrous! This is that scene! It's friggin' goddamn ludicrous! How did it get this again?! Baloo comes in to create a distraction as Bagheera saves Mowgli. But before getting him out, Louie reveals that the leader of the wolves is dead. Shere Khan killed him. Again, Bagheera could have relayed that information, but we have to pretend this pointless scene wasn't a pointless scene because, again, grown-up version! Finding this out, Mowgli sneaks into the man village to grab the red flower to fight off Shere Khan. A few drops of it fall and I can see where the phrase spread like wildfire comes from because shit! The whole jungle's on fire in seconds! Okay, this would literally have to go from this to this in a matter of a few minutes. Even wildfire doesn't spread like wildfire! So the animals are now afraid of Mowgli for starting the fire, even his family, but he throws out the fire, which is the stupidest thing he could have done. That was the stupidest thing you could have done. Right? If you destroyed their home, you might as well use it for its original intent. But the animals stand behind Mowgli to say, thanks for burning everything down, and why the hell didn't we rise up to fight this jackass days earlier? You all in my teeth! So all the animals rush in to take down Shere Khan, or Baloo just rushes in and everybody else just shows moral support. What can we do? We're just killer animals. We can't fight those killer animals. <laughs> Baloo gets taken down though, as everyone remembers. Oh yeah, we can like do something. As Mowgli is told not to fight him like a wolf, but fight him like a man. Fight him like a man. You know what this scene needs? Buzzards that sound like the Beatles. It'd be as inconsistent as everything else. Mowgli defeats Shere Khan through his inventive ways and he falls to his death. He also manages to convince the elephants to put out the fires. Yeah, they just dug holes with their tusks and led the water there. Though given how fast those flames spread, half of India should be on fire now! And the animals honor Mowgli. That night, I saw something I'll never forget. I saw a little boy, without a people, bring all the jungle together for the very first time. Except for that other time all the animals came together, which apparently happened so often you have a name for the place Peace Rock. You could come to the Peace Rock and find all people side by side. 
don't dress this up, Bagheera. He set your home on fire and somebody else put it out. He's the equivalent of a donkey kicking a lantern. But okay, you know the drill. After all this talk of acting like a man, fighting like a man, and thinking like a man, the time has come for him to go absolutely nowhere. Interesting change. In just about every version, he goes back to the man village because they build up, that's where he belongs. But this one doesn't do that. Why? No goddamn clue! I have no idea how this makes anything better. The story, in most of its forms, is about accepting the responsibility of who you are and where you'll grow best. But this one ends on an image just as lazy as the writing, closing the exact same book used in the animated film. Because you know, you just saw the animated film, except it's live action! They're so similar! Guys, I don't get this. I know objectively this isn't an awful film. If there were no books or other versions, it'd probably just be seen as a passable kids flick. But there is a book and a perfectly good animated film, and nothing in this is better than either of those. The original story is aggressive, dark, and full of great troops. The animated film is cute, charming, and full of unforgettable characters. This tries to combine them without realizing what made them work on their own. Are you going to remember any of these characters more than the animated one? Probably not. Are you going to remember the language or lessons as much as the book? I don't even think the movie remembers its own language or lessons. It keeps changing so much. This is the law of the jungle. There's a rock. That's my rock. That's my rock. I know there's no real harm in enjoying this film, but leaving out what made the book and the animated version so enjoyable and even important is a huge disservice to the storytellers who understand their medium and used it so cleverly. Whether it's a delightful little kids movie you'll return to more and more, or an epic coming of age story you'll return to more and more, this one will most likely be looked at less and less. And you know what? I want Disney to do an authentic version of this book. I want it so authentic that the author's name is above the title. The Jungle Book. Not directed by the idiot who directed the mummy movie. Strength of a bear. <laughs> Speed of a panther. <laughs> okay, maybe this version is not as bad as I thought. I'm a nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Stale as old as time, stale as it can be, recycled and tame, so much more the same, unfortunately, maybe just a change, singers that aren't fake, but the suits are scared, no one is prepared. Disney's plan remake All of it's the same Never a surprise But you watch it all Cause Disney's got your balls As the critics sign Even what is new Makes no freaking sense God, what wasn't half as dense? Certain as the cash the studio will make here a second time. Song spread for me wide. Disney's plan remain. Who cares if it blows? We're rolling in the dough. Disney's plan Oh, well, that's uh... Oh, wow.
I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to the final installment of Disney Live Action Remake Month. La la la, la la la, la la la, la la la. For the final one, let's talk about one of Disney's most beloved animated films, if not their most beloved animated film, Beauty and the Beast. With its amazing animation, stunning music, and unforgettable characters, it received a standing ovation at the New York Film Festival, was the first animated movie to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, and is regarded by many to be one of the best animated movies ever, if not the best. Yeah, remake that shit. The story of Beauty and the Beast has been told countless times. They range from quick children's cash-ins to unbelievably adult and mature to quick children's cash-ins. Despite it making a boatload of cash, audiences seem split on this remake. Some say it just told the same story minus the fresh take and joy. Others say it's a charming adaptation that captures the magic of the original. I say, you're full of shit, Knox. Is there any wiggle room for us purists that love the original so much? There's a lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. This is the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast. Oh look, they changed the logo again. Remember when I used to be clever and unique? Even the slight changes to the Disney format are becoming formulaic. As before, we get a backstory about a selfish prince who threw parties for only the most beautiful people in white bedsheets. Oh, how divine, glamour, music, and magic combine. Wow, that singing is beautiful. Don't get used to it. Ever as before, literally line for line, an old woman knocks on the door and asks for shelter, offering him a single rose as payment. But she warned him not to be deceived by appearances. When he dismissed her again, the old- But he didn't dismiss her again. She just started glowing and he backed off. Literally a stained glass window is being more consistent than you right now. As punishment, she transformed him into a hideous beast. Like seriously, the CGI on him was hideous. The prince and his servants were forgotten by the world, for the Enchantress had erased all memory of them. Yes, that's how we handle that plot hole, but fear not, we will create many more to confuse you. The title is shown just like in the last film, Belle's Home is shown just like in the last film, and the same song with the same angelic voice is sung just like in the last film. Little town. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, no three. You lost me after no three. Clearly trying not to get me back. The same old bread and rolls to sell. I've done a whole editorial about Emma Watson's painful auto-tuning and lack of emotion, but don't worry, the auto-tuning disappears when she talks. The lack of emotion, on the other hand... I didn't want to come back. Have you got any new places to go? Actually, maybe her whole performance needs auto-tuning. There must be more than... No, 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 okay, no more auto-tuning! Christ, you sound like Stephen Hawking's voice box! Isabelle is not only a bookworm, but the only bookworm in town. If it isn't the only bookworm in town. I'm so glad they decided to humanize her with more faults. But even that's not impressive, as there's only 12 books in this library slash church? That's like saying you're a movie buff if you've only seen eight films. And they're all pure flicks. Bye. Ah, okay, I'll buy it. Just stop singing. You sound like Tina from Bob's Burgers. Bye. Of course, we see the handsome guest Don has the hots for Belle, having just returned from battle. But ever since the war, I felt like I've been missing something. This creative choice adds a lot to his story and character because... I don't know, it's something different. Something you'll notice very quickly is while the song numbers clearly have a lot of work put into them, they still somehow seem slow and lifeless. You call this babe? Excuse me. I'll get the night. The original has the advantage of being animated. It can exaggerate everything and get the timing perfect, practically leaping off the screen. But still, why does it seem like there's so little energy here? Look, there she goes, the girl is so peculiar. Look, there she goes, the girl is so peculiar. Well, if I could borrow from another terrible cinematic musical. As bad as Greatest Showman got, it still was quite a spectacle when it came to the musical numbers. This is because not only is the movement keeping the energy up, but so are the camera angles, the editing, and what's being focused on. The majority of beats in every song have something visual keeping you connected to it. Go! This is just people walking around, and it's shot, edited, and feels like people just walking around. Goes, a girl, a 
Also, Belle is the only one who wore blue in the original, helping her stand out. Here? Who gives a shit? She's from Harry Potter. That's interesting enough. Wonderful book you have there. Have you read it? Uh, well, not that one, but you know, books. Much like the script, I didn't read it. Look out! The one good scene in the movie! How does a moment last forever? How can a story never die? I'm serious, this edition, though not sung very well, is filled with so much heart and emotion. In this one scene, through lyrics, paintings, and expressions, we know who he's singing about and what she meant to our leads without specifically addressing her. Please, just tell me one more thing about her. Except when they do. Papa, do you think I'm odd? Odd? You're forgettably bland. Odd would be a step up. Back in Paris, I knew a girl like you who was so different. People mocked her. Please, just tell me one more thing about her. Your mother was... Say it. Say it. Fearless. Odd! It should have been odd! He said how much he admires uniqueness and how being odd isn't bad. My heart was this close to melting. And what did you go with? Fearless. Oh, wow. I'm instantly going to forget about this scene. Right? So, what can I bring you from the market? The market? In the original, it was the fair. She was just at the market! Why the hell are you traveling a great distance for what's literally in your front yard? Is it wall market? Are the prices so good that we're traveling for? A rose, like the one in the painting. You ask for that every year. Okay, bring me a hairy CGI man with a rose if we want to hammer this in. And so, to add even more dimension to humanizing Belle, she apparently invents the washing machine! Yeah, that's a thing. What's he doing? The laundry. Wow, Belle really is Jesus! In that Jesus invented the chair, clearly established in the Passion! Aren't these too popular enough you don't have to have them invent shit? Now in the original, Belle is seen as odd because she's a bookworm that keeps to herself. But seeing how that was the kids' version and this one wants to be more adult, let's bell it out even more! What on earth are you doing? Teaching another girl to read isn't one enough. We have to do something. I'm gonna write up a plan to get her back! That is, if I knew how to read or write! They do have an evil plan, though. They knock over her washing machine! And it's really not shot like a big deal. It's only a few seconds they don't even focus on her looking angry. I actually feel more sorry for this guy. The attention seems to be focused on him. When will people just let women use washing machines? My god, that sounds sexist, Beauty and the Beast. Gaston approaches Belle and suggests they become an item, but Belle turns down his wedding proposal despite him never giving a wedding proposal. Some of us have changed. I'm never going to marry you, Gaston. I'm sorry. Now, of course, in the original, we see the beginnings of Gaston's cruel nature and Belle's frustration reaching her peak. Here, it's just another scene. Yeah, look at how angry he looks in the original. He says Belle's gonna be his wife. He marches off super angry after getting this whole big wedding proposal thing put together. Here, there's none of that. He looks more like, I'm in the mood for nachos. Maybe pizza, no nachos. Belle even goes into her big Madame Gaston song and it doesn't feel warranted. You see, time passed in the original so you can feel the emotions rising even when they're not on screen. It also allowed for a location change so you're not getting tired of looking at the same place for too long. But in this order, not only are we stuck in the village for longer than we need to be, but Belle just comes across as bland whining after bland whining. There's no break from it. I once adventure in the great white somewhere. Yeah, along with your mother back, your father talking about her more, girls reading, patenting your washing machine, a rose, Gaston not asking you to marry him even though he didn't ask you to marry him. And word of advice, don't smile when you're singing what you're frustrated about. I say that's child actor stuff, but you were a child actor! Belle's father gets lost on his way to presumably the greatest market in the world and stumbles across the Beast Castle. He finds it's filled with all sorts of nightmare utensils, oh, I mean, charming little friends, as he's intimidated by the place and escapes. Wait, wait, wait! Roses! I nearly forgot. I promised Belle a rose. I mean, sure, this place is haunted and I was fleeing for my life, but a rose! When am I gonna come across that? The beast captures the father, though, as the horse goes back to Belle and she demands that she's taken to him. <laughs> Pleasant weather than horrendous winter? I must be in Chicago! Such a wide range of expressions from Watson, isn't it? In the anime one, she holds her father's belonging close to her and looks worried. Here, she doesn't even glance at the damn thing. It just looks like she's been asked a hard math question. What's the square root of 329? Oh. 
It gets even better when she finds her father locked up and the beast confronts her. The film takes what was an emotional moment of fear and discovery and almost fast forwards through it. Look at the time it takes for every character to come to their decision. Belle has to think before offering up her life. Beast has to think before realizing he may have a way out of his damnation. The reveal of him is slow, letting her reaction sink in to what she's about to do. But that movie was an hour and a half and this is but a mere two hours, ten minutes. We gotta bullet point this shit! Quickly offering up her life. Punish me, not him. Check. Quickly revealing the beast. Check. Quickly having Beast realize what this could mean. Oh, we didn't even have time for that. Okay, whatever. Emotions are secondary in a romance. Why else would they show Beast and Belle together as little as possible? Not even kidding. Remember when the Beast sees her crying and feels bad and then decides to give her a nicer room while also being domineering? How he's trying to be sympathetic, showing some emotion, but losing it again when he brings up the West Wing, establishing a mysterious connection to it? <sighs> Going back and forth, establishing what a tortured character he is. Trying to be kind, but he's too filled up with anger from years of isolation. <sighs> Making Belle's new environment all the more uncertain and frightening. Making the danger, fear, and captivity feel all the more real. All gone! Yes, really. Now it's Cogsworth and Lumiere doing all that, because they didn't give them much time earlier for whatever reason. We don't even have a breakdown from Belle realizing the sacrifice she made. She just walks blandly through the palace with no fear, no intimidation, no nothing. Oh, but don't worry though, the beast is even less interesting. Even taking away how distracting his CGI is, even though it originally was gonna be makeup. It's like Superman's CGI upper lip, except it's the whole thing. But listen to this line from the original. Have you thought that perhaps this girl could be the one to break the spell? Of course I have! I'm not a fool. Well, guess who goddamn is? She's the daughter of a common thief. This beast hates that she's in a nicer room roaming around the castle and has to be told that she's the one that could possibly break the spell. You're making her dinner. You gave her a bedroom? It's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. Charm the prisoner. Okay, look, the other beast is a brute, but he still has some connection to an intelligent, emotional human being. That's what Belle has to discover. This one's just a dumbass. He's not intriguing, he's not smart, there's no sympathy, so there's no relating to him. Between both their lack of being invested in anything, I think the real couple I want to see get together in this is these two. So a mere 43 minutes in, and we're finally introduced to Mrs. Potts. God, I love how this movie is structured. As we're given, frankly, a confusing connection between the credenza and the wardrobe. Maestro, your wife is upstairs, finding it harder and harder to stay awake. She's counting on you to help us break this curse. Literally, that one line is the only thing that shows those two characters have a relationship. Do you follow it? Why is she tired? What does it mean that she's tired? Why is she upstairs? And don't they see each other or talk to each other at all? The place is big enough that they could work out something. We see her come to the balcony and the stairs seem big enough to support either of them. Why don't they see each other at all? You know, I already have one romance with a ton of plot holes I don't care about. Don't try to shoehorn in another. Belle is shown the dining room and we partake, of course, in the big showstopper, Be Our Guest. As the dining room proudly presents... Our leftovers, in every meaning of the word. The music number is honestly okay, despite Ewan McGregor as Lumiere sounding like a drunk Pepe Le Pew. Go on, unfold your menu, take a glass and then you'll be our guest. But because there's no real fear or danger built up, this doesn't feel as much as levity as much as obligation. We're not doing this to lift the emotional intensity Belle has gone through because, you know, that will require an emotion out of Belle. They're doing it because it'd be crazy not to do a song this popular. Plus, more creepy teapot faces. Am I gonna drink out of you or are you gonna drink out of me? It even ends kind of awkward. Houdin! <laughs> I understand why you were being so kind to me. Surely you're as trapped here as I am. Why did you need that weird cut? In the original, she says, that was great. Why don't we look around the castle? It was an easy segue. It would have been easy to have that before she walks through the rooms of sculpted tentacle porn to the West Wing. Oh my God, it looks just like the other rooms. 
I mean, come on, you remember how destroyed that room looked in the original? It was kind of like, whoa, what happened in here? But because the rest of the castle already looks like architectural clutter, this isn't the least bit jarring. I dare even say, the West Wing looks nicer than the other rooms in the castle. Dibs on the West Wing! But look out, an angry beast with hastily rushed lines! What are you doing here? What did you do to it? Nothing. Do you realize what you could have done? You could have damned us all! Get out of here! Seven seconds. From him appearing to her leaving, seven seconds. Don't get me wrong, the original wasn't that long either, but look, they're absorbing their actions, taking their time. What they say and do actually has weight to it, amounting to at least a bare minimum of 30 seconds. That's over double the time of this one. You'd think in a longer film they could have expanded on that, but no, they actually make it go quicker. Friggin' quicker! How does this film somehow go faster and slower at the same time? As you'd guess, Belle is cornered by wolves and the bee saves her. Belle's incredibly emotional animation is now replaced by a glance down. Whoa, be careful, that was a whole facial muscle you just used there! As we cut to, well, something new at least, Gaston trying to help Maurice find Belle. Where is Belle? The beast took her and she- There are no such things as beasts. I'll just be honest, I'm not entirely sure what Gaston's end game is here. He didn't believe Maurice, so why did he think he would find Belle? Did he even believe she was gone and not at home? Maybe he's just trying to get friendly with her. I will feed you to the wolves! Oh, maybe not. That's no way to talk to my future father-in-law now, is it? You will never marry my daughter. Now kindly help me find her, you clearly well-balanced human being. Oh, down I go. So Gaston goes from zero to murder pretty quick, leaving Maurice to be eaten by the wolves. The town baker finds him later and nurses him back to health. Not entirely sure where this is all going, but I'll wait it out to be disappointed. Meanwhile, Belle tends to the beast's wounds as the servants admit that they were cursed too because they didn't help when the beast's mean father made him so foul. And his cruel father took that sweet innocent lad and twisted him up to be just like him. We did nothing. We'll, of course, never see any of that apart from this pointless flashback of his mother dying. But it's okay, the more we don't show the Beauty and the Beast interacting in a movie called Beauty and the Beast, the more things will fall into place. With the eyes, but with the mind. Therefore, Therefore is winged Cupid. Oh yeah, an hour ten in. I guess we can start having some chemistry now. The other film would only have 20 minutes left. Romeo and Juliet's my favorite play. So many better things to read. Like what? There are a couple of things in here you could start with. Oh, yeah, so the Beast doesn't give Belle the library to show his thanks and that he understands something she loves. He just accidentally shows it off, trying to get her mind off romance. So much better! Oh, and here's an interesting addition. What happens when the last petal falls? We become antiques. Rubbish. Yeah, if the spell is broken, they don't stay that way. They become actual inanimate objects. So... I hate to keep saying this, but, um... In the goddamn original, when they're doing the song numbers and being friendly, there's an underlying fear that they'll stay that way, but they at least have been like that for years. They can survive. Here, they will literally die! Why the friggin' hell are you singing and dancing? In fact, isn't Belle kinda selfish knowing this could be their last days and she's just bonking up with the beast? Shouldn't everyone be in an awkward position right now? Belle, what is wrong? I'm sorry, I just can't focus on romance right now when this could be your last night alive. Oh, but we are happy to serve you. There is no pressure to fall in love with the beast. What? Oh, nothing. I didn't say anything. Oh god, what have I done? <laughs> Falling in love with the beast will break the curse? But you're not supposed to know that, or it's less likely to happen. No, no. No, that's fine. I'm glad you told me. I'm just gonna go fall in love with him and not think about it at all. But the knowledge is just going to get in the way! No, I'm sure I can make this work. I'll totally... I'll make it work. You're right, I can't make this work. It's all I can think about! Oh god, what did I have to tell you? I just can't get my mind off of it now! I don't even know where the soul of the candlestick goes! Do I have an afterlife, or do I just... just... Oh god! Uh, okay, I'm gonna go invent the toaster or something. I'm so sorry I couldn't help. Where does the soul of the candlestick go? Where does the soul of the candlestick go? <laughs> We do get a legit nice moment with them talking on a bridge, followed by a weird as hell moment of her getting sucker punched by a snowball. 
But we're given yet another odd addition of finding out that the Beast has a book that can literally, and I guess literarily, take him anywhere. What? A book that truly allows you to escape. The outside world has no place for a creature like me, but it can for you. So when I'm asleep and you want to escape, you totally can. We just made this even more of a Stockholm movie! They use it to see where Belle's mother died. Always a romantic spot. And they never use it again. <sighs> you know, wasn't that the idea of the mirror? The only window to the outside world? Now that window turned into a goddamn United Air Flight! True, they don't treat dogs well and that could be an issue, but I think you can still go places where there's little to no people. Isolation, my ass! I'll gladly get turned into a beast if it means I can literally go anywhere in the world! But nope, let's stay here and awkwardly do our ballroom scene that feels more like two third graders being forced to hold hands. Yeah, this scene was pretty romantically laid out in the original, wasn't it? They make a whole evening out of it, they eat at the table, he learned how to use a spoon, she gets the idea to go dance, but he's nervous because he clearly doesn't know how, so she teaches him, and they both become comfortable in each other's arms. It feels real. It built up to this lovely moment, and it feels genuine. Again. All skipped! Just go straight to the ballroom! Go down the stairs, turn right, that's all people really want to see, just the image, not anything that led up to it! How is this even proposed? If you're not doing anything tonight, I was hoping we could just go to the ballroom, dance for exactly two minutes, and stare blankly at each other. But it'll lead to this shot! That means we're in love now. Great plan, by the way, to have currently one of the greatest living singers in your movie and have Emma Thompson sing your big song. As the sun will rise. I'm sure McDonald couldn't top that. God, you're a bad movie! Belle sees through the mirror, though, that Gaston is having her father locked up. Not to get Belle to marry him, but just to cover his tracks for trying to kill him. That is so much better! Wait, it's bullshit! It's bullshit! He's in trouble. Then you must go to him. Wow, again. Barely even thought about it. This is actually kind of amazing! Look at the same scene in the good movie. He was told he was dying. He looks at the rose, thinks for a moment, on the verge of tears. He then tells her she can go. He realizes what he's giving up, but he loves her so much he's willing to make the sacrifice. This sounds more like an office favor. Hey, I need a digital copy of this, and Frank is the only one with a scanner. You must go to him. Okay, I'll CC you on this. You must go to him. No time to waste. That's why I'm having you go on horseback and not the magic book that can take you anywhere and bring him right back. Easily solving two problems. But then we couldn't have the Gimme Oscar song. No, I know she'll never leave me. Kind of ironic seeing how Disney stole the Oscar from Disney. The song itself is okay, despite it not being very well sung. And I'll even give credit to the Kill the Beast song after Belle convinces everyone the Beast is real. He him lost, see him come, but we're not coming home till he's dead! It's well edited, well shot, and keeps the energy very high. For the first half. Call it war, call it threat, you can bet they all will follow- Yeah, slow horseback riding, I am so amped right now! Mm. The climax is pretty standard with comedic slapstick leading up to the showdown between the Beast and Gaston. Belle, of course, arrives, giving him the courage to fight back. Don't hurt me, Beast! I am not a Beast. Granted, I have no other name in this. Even the woman I love calls me Beast, but I just don't like the way you say it. Gaston gets one last shot before falling to his death. The living objects are turned into inanimate objects, and Belle confesses her love in... Front of the Enchantress? That's right! The Baker Woman was the Enchantress the whole time! And on top of transforming the Beast and everyone back to normal, well, mostly normal, this blink is weird. She also gives the townspeople back their memories. Oh yeah, it looks like some of them have friends and family in that castle that she kept separated for years and years. Oh, I remember. I do. <laughs> this is a goddamn messed up lady. She's gonna punish the servants with death if the beast doesn't fall in love. She erased all memory of government, kept families apart, pretty much altered this entire world, and for what? So they could learn overcoming prejudice comes down to beastly violence? So she could let another selfish asshole ruin things while she watches and does nothing? That dude served in war too, why wasn't he given the beast treatment rather than just watching him die? 
Her secretly viewing this doesn't make her an all-knowing angel, it makes her a friggin' psychopath! She is a goddamn psychopath! This movie is messed up. But, happily ever after, I guess! Tee hee ha ha, everyone's so happy, just forget the mayhem and terror that bestowed us, Christ. And look, the best singer actually gets the finishing I mean, song up, oh, not quite. Chad at McDonald, you got this voice to contend with. <laughs> but she got the last note, bitches! <laughs> and that was... really hard to get through. The original is a classic telling of a timeless story. This is just a remake. A remake that doesn't understand what made the original story so powerful. While it's shorter and arguably simpler, every choice plays a part in driving the character's motivations. The emotions feel justified and earned. This one just changes things that don't need to be changed, didn't add enough to make it its own thing, and sped up parts that needed to remain slow. It's as if the story is still there, but the wrong parts are focused on, leading to something that looks familiar but feels false. If you enjoy it, more power to you, but I can tell you, this is a beast I don't think I can ever learn to love. Thank you for watching Disney's Live Action Remake Month, and I gotta tell you, after seeing all these animated classics turn into these live action abominations, I gotta see some cartoon that's put to live action done right. <laughs> that's not it. Is Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. There's a very old saying, if it's not broke, Disney's remake of Aladdin sucks. In the ongoing need to suck nostalgia's withering teat, Disney offers us its latest multi-million dollar budget table scraps. The funny thing about this one was people were kind of onto it at first, especially with the portrayal of the genie. At first, audiences were angry he appeared not to be blue. Clearly the biggest problem this movie could face. Then when they saw he was blue, but awkwardly computer generated, people freaked again. With Disney reassuring folks that he will look less awkward in the final film. And that, um... Hello? Um... Oh my god. I think you... Christ! He's making his Shark Tale animation look like Paddington! This is the less awkward genie? Well, let me tell you, as a crowd that's been duped a million times in the past, we're totally gonna be duped again! Yep, despite mixed critical reviews, crowds once again seem to love Disney shit being shoveled right back into their mouths. But to the film's credit, there is a lot more to it than just an awkwardly animated Fresh Prince of Booberry. You're forgetting the flat lead, lame villain, boring comedy, and complete lack of anything fresh or memorable that made the original a household classic. But it... Looks like thing I associate with good, so must have substance. It's the Instagram of movies! Okay, I'm gonna try and figure out why this film is beloved by so many, while giving the point of view of a douchebag who likes it when Disney, you know, Disney's and not Disney's. Let's take a look at the crowd-pleasing box office remake, where were you guys? We were doing so good! Aladdin. So we start off this Arabian night with a pirate ship. You know what, it's different. In a Disney remake, that's like seeing a leprechaun feed a unicorn fresh Easter bunny. You just don't see it! Two kids on a smaller ship admire the Black Pearl as their father, played by Will Smith, says it's not worth the staring. I'd be so happy if ours was that fancy. Because it looks better? Look, just because something is clearly animated doesn't make it better. I mean, okay, in this case it does, but I got paid a lot of money for this! I think it's time that I told you the story. Maybe if you sing. It's better when you sing. A lot of people disagree with that. Oh, we don't now! Okay, can you give me the memo of Smith things we like and Smith things we don't like? Where the caravan camels roam Where you wander among Every culture and tongue Really? I hear they cut off your ear if they don't like your face! Listening to that shit again, huh? Whoopsie! 
to another Arabian Nights. Yeah, Will Smith singing isn't that great, but I will give credit, this version of Arabian Nights is actually pretty solid. As the credits roll, it expands on the song, adding different melodies and mixing up the orchestration, while also showing us Agrabah and introducing us to our main characters. There's a rule that may lead you to good or to green through the power your wish in command. At first I thought, this was actually gonna do things right. Add and improve as opposed to take away and repeat. But then we get this in the same sequence. The diamond in the rough. Yeah. That's our intro to the Cave of Wonders and the villain. Two big parts of the story. In the original, they build up the villain. They build up the cave. Where'd that gold bug come from? Shit, look at that entrance! Only one may enter here. Suddenly there's a mystery. The story is immediately in motion. So much character and information is cleverly introduced to you in a way you would never forget. Who disturbs my slumber? And eh, never mind, we don't have time. Rick, how is this movie longer? I'm Jafar! Move over, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Most epic movie intro ever unlocked. We're introduced to the street rat Aladdin, played by Mina Masoud, who comes across Princess Jasmine disguised as a peasant, played by Naomi Scott. Both look and sound exactly like their animated counterparts, but where things get awkward is their chemistry. One of these performers is acting their friggin' heart out every moment on screen, while the other clearly thinks these are the rehearsal takes. Can you tell which one is which? Aladdin, isn't it? Uh, you're welcome. The queen was killed. The Sultan's been afraid. It seems everyone's been afraid since then. You can't escape what you were born into. You should tell the princess to get out more. Oh, do you have my bracelet? Yes, it's beautiful. Am I still on camera? Oh, I guess so. You'll be fine. I feel bad picking on this guy, because he clearly can move and dance, he looks good and sounds good, he's multi-talented. But for whatever reason, take two was an outlawed phrase when he was on set. While the princess is out, would you like to go for a stroll? Don't raise your voice at me! Gotta keep one jump ahead of the red line. Watching the One Jump Ahead song, now including Jasmine this time, there's two major problems I can't help but compare to the original. One is, it's not funny. So much slapstick and clever wordplay was utilized in the original, but here, there's not that many laughs. And that might be because of number two, the film has the disadvantage of not being animated. Yes, I said disadvantage. Both live action and animation have their pros and cons, and you can definitely see the pros of animation and the cons of live action here. In the original, there's constant movement, constant momentum, and even constant character. Not only can you fit in a lot more funny moments because you have more control, but you get across Aladdin's persona much more because he can have the perfect expression for literally every frame. Look at him, he's bursting with personality and energy in every moment. And on top of that, it's timed perfectly to the music. So much likability has gotten across here that we're taking for granted. Now look here, sometimes there's a cool stunt, but the rest of the time it's just kind of meandering. The awkwardly move with slow down and sped up footage, I guess, to simulate energy. Similar to a Bollywood movie, but we'll get to that in a bit. Regardless, it always feels unnatural and off. It doesn't even focus on the right things. Remember this crazy lady? Do I think he's rather tasty? Of course you do, she's terrifying, you can't forget her. In this one, she's not even in half the frame. Imagine if the other one just trailed off during her line. It wouldn't make any sense. Still, I think he's rather tasty. But that's the thing. The film assumes you've seen the original, so it doesn't have to try as hard to make an impact. The first one didn't have that luxury. Tell me what you remember more. These random kids he tosses dates to like it's barely even a moment? Or these big-eyed starving puppy dogs that just guaranteed you're going to give to five charities this week? Everything is magnified in animation, which means focusing on the right thing will make it all the more memorable. The remake is taking advantage of the original's focus so they don't have to try as hard. Look how much these words really impact Aladdin's core. You were born a street rat, you'll die a street rat, and only your fleas will mourn you. You see it all over his face. The emotion is just oozing out of him. Now watch it here. You are die worthless. I don't know your fleas will mourn you. Oh, that sucks. But good to know my fleas care about me. BAD! 
The one thing more explored and arguably improved on is Jasmine's character, who was already fine in the original, but it's nice to see some add-ons. She's given more responsibility outside of just saying she hates being royalty, her father is more competent and interesting, and they even do actual ruling stuff like talking about foreign policy. Kind of to a fault! Yeah, weirdly the concern of the original was the main characters and where they lived. Odd, right? In this one, there's a lot of focus on a place called Shirabat, where Jasmine's mother was from. It's a land we've never seen, know nothing about, yet for some reason it's the most important thing in this movie. Shirabat continues to amass. Shirabat is our ally. Marshal an army to invade Shirabat. Invade Shirabat? Invade Shirabat. 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 I haven't been this invested since talks of taxation in The Phantom Menace. What are we doing? And then there's Jafar, the aging, sinister, booming voice. He's been pretending the entire time. An imposter. Ensure your agonizing death. Daily show correspondent in a Halloween costume. <laughs> okay, this actor's gotten a lot of flack for how miscast he was. Even people that like the movie usually don't like him. So let's just say, does he look like him? <coughs> Sound like him? <coughs> Have any qualities better than him? <coughs> it is a nice feather, I'll give you that. I'll also give the movie credit that they do try to give more time to Aladdin and Jasmine's romance, with him sneaking into the palace trying to talk to her more. But don't worry, someone funny will fix that up. Jasmine's servant Dahlia, played by Nazem Padrad, pretends to be the princess while Jasmine pretends to be her handmaiden. It is good to be me with all my palaces and wagons of gold things. Well, it's not too broke, girls, but few things are. Jafar sees Aladdin up to his street rat tricks of stealing effects from bad Prince of Persia games, and he captures him. He takes him to the Cave of Wonders, assuming he's the diamond in the rough. Yeah, the whole magic ring telling him stuff is cut out, so... Just made a lucky guess! As we're given his one good line in the entire movie. Steal an apple and you're a thief. Steal a kingdom and you're a statesman. That's literally the only question you have to answer in order to be a politician. Jafar says if he can get him the lamp, he can reunite him with Jasmine. So he takes him to the cave where he's told not to touch anything but the lamp. Here's a count of all the things they touch. Guess the Cave of Wonders was drunk when it was on gold security. Oh my head. Hey, you ain't touching anything, right? Uh, who cares? I'm gonna lose it all in the divorce. Like in the original, he comes across the magic carpet. Oh, hey. Don't mention it. Nah, I shouldn't bring you with. You may turn in a better performance than me. Actually, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but even the rug isn't as good an actor. Look how much emotion this thing has in the original. Somehow you know what it's feeling and what its personality is like. He's happy, but he's sensitive. He can get hurt, but he wants to help out. This one's happy when he's free from a rock, but aside from that, he just vanishes until the plot says, Need you for a sec. Nah, okay, fuck off. You couldn't even get a rug right. What are you doing to my rug? They peed on your fucking rug. As you'd expect, Aladdin finds the lamp, but Abu touches the 90th thing in the cave, which was just one too many. Could you give me a hand? First, the lamp. He gets to Jafar, who says he'll give him a hand if he gives the lamp. Now your hand. How about my foot? If only that creepy read was in the original. What are you doing? How about my foot? Okay, that was more of an awkward creep. Aw, creep. Like before, Abu steals the lamp before getting trapped in the cave, leading to... Excuse me, boy, where's your boss? Me getting booze! I'm sorry, I'm way too sober for this. Save me, Jin! You're the blue wish granter that actually makes me feel good. <laughs> I believe you're actually there! So, okay, let's talk about Will Smith as the genie. First of all, I get it. We're never gonna top Robin Williams or the brilliant team of animators that brought him to life. It's entirely pointless to try, so let's try! Bring anybody back from the dead! Step two, say, say what, what you want. want. Downward dog! Now you've been using Comets, Camels, and Caravans. Please don't forget to tip your genie on the way out. Again, this is a big disadvantage with live action. In animation, it's all the same realm. 
They're all drawn lines against painted backgrounds, so it all blends together. This looks like Casper's uncle got plastered and is trying to embarrass him in front of his girlfriend. I never once believed they were actually looking at each other. Well, Alibaba, he had them 40 thieves. You have a side, he had a thousand tears. It's awkward enough they're trying to do the same high-energy visuals that just don't transfer in the slower world. That's your personal business, but... We're gonna need to talk about that monkey later. God, it feels like he's bombing at an SNL audition. Woo! I'm the best. But Smith's head always looks like it's about to fall off his body. It's like someone made a bobblehead doll where the size of the body matches the head, yet the head still wiggles for some reason. I don't know, who cares? Now surprisingly, it's followed up by a really good rendition of Friend Like Me. Like Arabian Night, it mixes up the song a bit, but also has visuals that support it in a pretty grand way. Brand, brand, lie, lie. It's like, damn, we're actually in a good Aladdin remake for a minute here. I'll also give credit that Smith actually isn't that bad when he's not covered in Navi splooge. When he's allowed to chill and turn on his laid-back charm, he's actually all right. Who's the girl? She's a princess. Aren't they all? Treat your woman like a queen, I always say. We do get that half the time, but the other half? The other half. The genie! The genie is on fire! The genie's on fire, folks! I just want to make sure this isn't funny, right? I mean, people have science to prove that this isn't funny, correct? It's just awkward, weird, and doesn't match Will Smith's style. The irony of both versions is that they emphasize to be yourself, which is a lesson this performance really could have learned from. Put simply, he's a much better Will Smith than he is a Robin Williams. And that would be fine if the movie reinforced that. Take the Prince Ali song, the original focused on Williams' zany voices that translated beautifully into animation, turning it into an explosive number. Since this isn't Williams or animation, though, it would make sense if they did something like the old Disney musicals. Make the focus be the amazing stuns, dances, and variety of movement. Well, they get that all set up and... Ah, let's just focus on two guys standing around while they can't sing. Show some respect, boy, can you flat down on one knee? What is wrong with you? This is like a spectacle waiting to happen, a giant Bollywood musical at your feet! and you're treating it like a Disney parade of standbys. Even the editing is like, ooh, this looks cool. Nah, needs more people barely moving. Don't worry, we'll balance it out with this nightmare fuel. Prince Ali, handsome is he, Ali Ababa. Oink pulled it off better. I think most people have pointed out a good chunk of the film becomes hit with Smith trying to give Aladdin dating advice. What they failed to bring up is the epic jam dialogue. We have jams. Jam? Jams! Yes, jams. Yam jams, fig jams. Yam jams. And, and date jams. I really hope you like humor about jams next to Shirabat, the most mentioned word in the entire movie. Exotic jams. For the jam. The jams. Jam jams. Move away from the jams. Interesting experiment. If you play this movie along with Ponyo, all you'll hear is jams. Ham. Jams. Ham. Jams. Ham. That night, they're invited to a get-together where Aladdin tries again to win her over. I made you look like a prince on the outside, but I didn't change anything on the inside. You're still the same boring, dull clod you always were. Jasmine invites him to dance, but it appears he doesn't know how. Because a thief who can climb walls and jump buildings clearly has no footwork. He's dancing right here! Isn't this the same day? Genie controls his movements, though, in a scene that, hey, actually focuses on the dancing. Aw, oh, can't we focus on Genie's hat some more? That's where the real wow is. You know I did have a few jokes about this scene, but his dancing is just so damn awesome, I, I, I'll give him a break. Later, we see Genie hitting on the handmaiden, and he's apparently awkward, too. Oh, it's funny, because it doesn't make sense to his personality at all. How did you get past the guards? I snuck past. All 48 of them? Even the ones that eat fire? Your guards are weird. Would you like to take an evening stroll? I've never done this before. How does it work? Do you like sheep cheese? Well, it's no jam line, but... He takes her on a date as Aladdin sneaks in to talk to Jasmine. Sometimes, you just have to take a risk. Try this at home, kids! <gasps> Is this... a magic carpet? They sing a whole new world with absolutely nothing new except an angry phone call to a voice coach. 
Now when did you last let your heart decide? Russell Crowe and Emma Watson are high-fiving each other right now as they're no longer the big musical punchlines. A whole new world. Oh, thank God for orchestras. My notes are as flat as the carpet I'm writing. A whole new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. A hundred thousand things to see. The scene is so empty, it feels like the music video for the original Aladdin. Like, isn't that cute? We kind of look like the real couple that had real chemistry from the real movie. iTunes link down below. Like in the last one, she discovers who he is, but makes up even more lies. He told me he was only pretending to be a thief to see the city, but he's actually a prince. I really was a prince. And you believed him? Tell me more, tell me more, did she make your heart swoon? Tell me more, tell me more, was his voice auto-tuned? Once again, the guards capture Aladdin as Jafar figures out who he is as well. Goodbye, Aladdin. No! Hey, at this point, it'd be the same runtime as the original. But Carpet and Abu rush to his aid and save him from drowning, or they toss him the lamp. Carpets obviously melt in water. You know the drill. The genie comes out, uses a wish to save him, and Jafar tries to say he left. You heard him say this, Jafar, and you saw him leave? Yes. Just ask him yourself! Ah! Your Majesty. Jafar is arrested, but Iago breaks him out as Aladdin realizes he can't use his last wish to set Genie free. People see what they want to see. Aladdin is gone. Pfft, no arguments here. It's weird, because Aladdin actually seems a lot douchier in this version, making us like him even less. In the first one, he's legit broken up about it. He can set his friend free. In this one, though, it's almost like he's boasting about it. It's not a lie. People can change. <laughs> That's a bad thing? I thought you'd be happy for me. I know you'll be a slave the rest of your life, but look on the bright side. I won't! And for what? You are breaking my heart here, kid. Man, that's some die-hard Padme heartbreaking acting right there. No Disney movies should have this many callbacks to the prequels! Take note! Genie, no, hey, come on! How come you don't want me, man? Jafar steals the lamp, though, and uses his first wish to become Sultan. You obey the Sultan. Hakim, marshal an army to invade Shirabat. Shirabat. Nobody cares about Shirabat! Invade Florida! It has all our grandparents! We'll care a little! Remove her! Jasmine is arrested as she sings a brand new song about not being speechless. I cannot start to crumble. It's a decent song, despite it not matching the feel of the others at all. But it does go a little weird. I will be my god, she was the genie all along. Now that's a twist this movie needs! No, this is actually a symbolic fight she's having right now. Ooh! Face the wrath of my furious anger as I wish you away in my head! Okay, I get the idea. She uses diplomacy and not force to convince the guards to do the right thing. Technically making this a completely wasted wish. What, does becoming Sultan just get you a new hat? But man, how cool would it be if she was grabbing a sword and fighting in slow motion while singing Let It Go 2.0? And then she does the diplomatic scene. She could be telling her friend, the head of the guards, thank you for teaching me sword fighting since I was a kid, so it explains how she can do all that cool stuff. And that would tug at his heartstrings even more. It would make so much sense. But nope, it's the literal thought that counts as she sings about how she refuses to be silent. Moments before she's completely silenced. I will do as you wish. So yeah, this scene could have been completely cut and we wouldn't miss a thing, but, you know, henchwomen. So okay, Aladdin comes in and is revealed as a street rat just before saving the day. What? Wait, what? We're doing the ice thing again? Why? He's right there! In the original, everything goes to shit at once, and he discovers the errors of his ways at this point. Here, he learned it when he saw Jafar with the lamp, and we had Jasmine learning her lesson because she was the main character for a minute. So this just drags things out. But, but, but what does it do? Allow Jafar to show off more of his you just basic acting? You're insignificant. An irritation I no longer need to tolerate once I banish you to the ends of the earth. You're not even worth any effort from my performance. Sorry that was so loud. No, the most suitable punishment would be to make you watch while I take what you love most. While well, I make kissy faces at you the whole time, do you like that? Blah, 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 blah. Like in the original, Aladdin uses the carpet to fly back to Agrabah and save everybody. 
And like before, he has to confront a giant, terrible hell beast, a parrot. Yep, they replaced the giant snake with a giant parrot. My god, are you trying to piss us off? If you saw these two movies on at the same time, why the hell would you pick this pathetic idiot sauce when you could watch something kick-ass like this? Seriously, who in the Christ requested that? You know what would be cooler than a giant snake? A giant parrot! So after the epic giant parrot chase, literally every episode of the cartoon had a better climax than that. They work their way back where Jafar captures them again. This movie really is good at going absolutely nowhere, isn't it? You can't find what you're looking for in that lamp, Jafar. I am the greatest sorcerer the world has ever seen. I turned a small parrot into a big parrot. Crazy! But you'll never have more power than the genie. I will not be silent. Eh, whatever. Girl power or some shit. As before, Aladdin tricks Jafar into wishing himself into a genie for even more power, and he gets trapped in his own lamp. Aladdin then uses his last wish to set Genie free so he can go after some Handmaid's Tale. I want children. Yes, two of them. Leanne and Omar, three years apart. You will entertain them with stories and songs. This is really specific. All involved should be afraid. The Sultan then hands over his crown to Jasmine. Which is weird, Will Smith is still telling the story even after he revealed he was the story. Kinda of feel like it should end there. She of course chooses to marry Aladdin and we get, in my opinion, one of the biggest insults of the movie, the credits. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm usually happy as hell when they arrive in a movie like this, but look at how they do it. Yeah, that's spectacular! It's like a full-on Bollywood musical, with no CG genies, no awkward editing, just really good dancing, and people actually looking like they're having a good time. Mixing both Hollywood and Bollywood style techniques. Why wasn't this the entire movie? How freaking amazing would this film have been if it actually told Aladdin like a crazy Bollywood musical? It would have been something new while still keeping true to the story of Aladdin. The possibilities are endless. But instead, it's the end credits. Like they're teasing us, like we know we could have done this, but eh, we're just gonna put it at the end, at the part where people usually walk out. So I guess I was wrong in that regard. This movie made me realize it wasn't dead on arrival. It was a friggin' missed opportunity! Trust me, for me, that's a big thing to say with a Disney remake! I'll say this, upon watching it again, I did see a few things that I did find impressive. Jasmine and her father had more depth, the songs were orchestrated nice, and once in a while there was an impressive visual when you were allowed to enjoy it. But seriously, half of it relies on you seeing the original in order to even follow it. It's got way too many dead silent moments, awkward acting, and lack of focus on what their priorities should be. I guess compared to some of the other remakes, it had a few things that stood out, which is more than I can say for many of the others. But I can't just give a positive shrug because it's less bad than the others. There's an incredibly unique and imaginative classic that fixes the majority of this film's problems before they even existed. And it did so by being new and innovative, as opposed to copying what's new and innovative. And even then only doing so because it was proven to have worked in the past. If you enjoy it, cool, you're entitled to your opinion. But for me, this is an Arabian night I'm not going to be checking out any time again soon. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Hey there, Julie. Hello, Bob. So tell me your ideas for a cinematic Lion King remake. Gladly. It begins as before with the sun rising in Africa, though it is half CG and half real footage. So you're looking to combine live action and animation then? Exactly, but it's not like every other movie does it. You see, it's not about the technology. It's about the feel of the world and the characters. It'll be like my Broadway show. Same songs and characters, but on a more unique and grander scale. We'll still have actors and costumes, but it'll be less puppets and more clothes, similar to what I did in the film Titus. So like in that film, it takes place in no time period and every time period. 100%. And it's kind of a Jesus Christ superstar vibe. 
but won't people miss the elaborate costumes from your stage show? Well, we don't want to give people what they've already seen, do we? We want to give them new ideas against a familiar story. I see what you're saying. There will be no big Hollywood stars. All the actors will be African, and we'll build the environment out of African culture, artwork, and history. It'll be like Black Panther mixing modern technology with timeless traditions to create something new yet classic. Black Panther was beloved by a lot of people. The battles will be comprised of the finest fight choreography, with the actors carrying wrist blades that look similar to claws. It'll be more violent than the other Disney remakes, showing that we want to grow up with our Disney audience and not treat them like children forever. We've currently been experimenting with that. At the end, when the circle of life is sung once more, a real baby is held up, and the world is revealed to be a mix of modern-day Africa and years of history that inspired the stage show. So we represent the complicated past with the complicated future, not just for Africa, but the human animal as a whole, fighting for the power, justice, and unity. Wow. Well, that sounds brilliant. You like it? It's challenging, it's brave, it pushes the boundaries of not only what Disney can do, but what cinema can do. And it doesn't have to be that expensive. It's not about looking real, it's about feeling real. Absolutely. Wonderful. So shall we start production next year? Oh, we're not going to make it. What? No, I set up this meeting to see what we shouldn't do for a Lion King remake. I just took everything you said and wrote down the complete opposite. But why? You're a thinker, Julie, and people don't want that. We want to give them comfort food under the guise of something deep and timeless even though we're just feeding folks the same old shit. Don't you want to challenge and evolve and enlighten your fan base? Not as much as I want to make money. Well, that was the saddest featurette I've ever seen. It's time to get up. Do we have to, Chaplin? Nope. All right, Buster. Now we really should get up. But I was seeing if I slept like this if I would dream upside down. That's as brilliant as me sleeping on a mirror to see if I dream backwards. So what are we going to do today, Chaplin? It's time you learn the benefits of becoming the next cash cow. Wow! I'm Chaplin. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Wow, and how about that shadowy stuff? That's ours too. We're cats. We own everything. Got it. As a cat on an online show, I serve as the series cash cow. But one day, Buster, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new cash cow. And this will all be mine? If you pee on it, yes. And I can do whatever I want? Buster, there's more to being a cat than getting your way all the time. There's more? Actually, no, that's it. Hooray! But, dear nephew, son, or brother, you must learn the ways of being a profitable cash cow. Well, how do I learn? By watching our master, the Nostalgia Critic, talk about one of the biggest cash cows of all time, the Lion King. Which one? The original or the remake? There is no difference between them, yet they still make money. Wow, that is a cash cow. Now, let's see our master scorn the gods again. Is his face usually that red? Only when he talks about recent Disney films. Ooh. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, what can I say that everyone else hasn't already said about this movie? It's spectacular. That's something that hasn't been said about it yet. But we all know it's bullshit, and yet our nostalgia made us see it. So I guess the real question is, what the hell is wrong with us? The 2019 Lion King remake was laughed at by many, but in the end, it's Disney who had the last laugh. All the way to the bank. For a while, it was the highest grossing animated film. Not adjusted for inflation, I don't even think it cracks the top five when you factor that. Frozen 2 would eventually beat it out, yay? But the writing was on the wall, this was a massive hit. Despite critics and online crybabies like myself complaining about how shallow and uninspiring it is, the typical movie going public ate it up like warthogs in a blanket. Ew. As much as people like to make fun of it, there's clearly a fan base for it. 
So the questions then become, what's wrong with the film, how can it be fixed, who enjoys it, what's their addresses, and how much shit can I produce in paper bags on their birthdays? Let's analyze the how, why, and... No, no, I'm still stuck on the why. This is Lion King 2019. Ooh, we're gonna get some good information here, huh, Buster? Buster? Just a second! I feel like if I grab this string, I'll change the world! Stop being cute! As if that has anything to do with being a cash cow! I'm Buster! I'm Buster! The film immediately mocks us with the logo in the traditional hand-drawn style Lion King was praised for. It'd be like the author of Artemis Fowl opening that film with, I think we're in good hands. <laughs> we open on the only live-action shot in the entire movie, which... I guess I should clear up some confusion. This is a fully animated feature. Despite the media calling it a live-action remake, Disney never officially referred to it as such. Though they didn't go out of their way to correct anybody either. My guess is they liked that people thought some of it had to be real, and I'll be honest, I was 100% convinced at least the backgrounds were shot in Africa. It fooled me, and that's not an easy thing to do when it comes to CG. So on a technical level, I do have to give them a lot of credit. But then this raises a question. If the entire film is animated, why does it look so ugly? Africa is gorgeous, such a wide variety of colors, shapes, and environments. The original took advantage of being animated and magnified even more how grand and epic their landscapes are. It's one of the few movies where whenever it's released on the big screen, I always buy a ticket to go see it. Here, every shot looks like it was soaked in cat piss and dried off with monkey shit. It's fucking hideous! But part of the reason for that may be that the director, John Favreau, said he wanted the film to look like a BBC documentary. So he didn't go for a lot of pretty shots because he felt like it wouldn't have looked as realistic. Okay, I guess I can understand trying to create a style and trying to go for realism over fantasy and stuff. There's just one problem. ANIMALS DON'T FUCKING TALK! Realism ruined! Yeah, a lot of it looks like it's really there and that's a credit to the animators, but the idea as a whole doesn't work. If you told the story without any talking or songs, granted it would have been very difficult and incredibly risky, I would see how that could work and would tip my hat to such a daring idea, even if it failed. 101 Dalmatians did something similar, and that turned out okay. But this makes no sense. If you want us to have a connection, you either have to embrace the human emotion of the characters or the realism of the animals. You can't do both. Because the warm, welcoming embrace of two friends who have known each other for years now looks like a janitor just doing his Thursday thing. There's no heart in it whatsoever. Even the other animals have a look like, Ah shit, was that today? Alright, buck up, we have to pretend we like the people who are gonna eat us in the future. It's the same. Motherfucker doesn't even stand! The ruler of this great circle isn't even worth a little energy in your legs? Asshole! Hell with that though, a mouse! Yeah, this was only a few seconds in the original, but now it's given over a minute of screen time because it's so vitally important. No, no, they're not just showing off their technology like maybe what this whole entire movie is. Uh-uh. This is crucial story going on here. Will the mouse shit? <gasps> Will the mouse shit? You don't even get that giant paw coming down that literally shook the theater when you saw it on the big screen. Scar just emerges out of the shadows like every villain and everything. But they look real. It's a waste of time, but at least it's a realistic looking waste of time. The way I see it. We both want to find a way out. Scar, played by Chitatao Egafor, and yes, I did have to watch a video to figure out how to pronounce that, is approached by Zazu, played by John Oliver, who was kind enough to leave Rowan Atkins in the charm of his interpretation by bringing a buttload of annoyance to his. I had a cousin who thought he was a woodpecker. He slammed his head into trees, and our beaks aren't built for it. He was concussed. Tonight's story, me. Why aren't I funny here? Mufasa Arise, voiced again by James Earl Jones, who clearly should have played Simba's grandfather as opposed to father, as at almost 90 years old, every line delivery sounds like it's gonna be followed by, didn't I already say this? Don't turn your back on me, Scar. Perhaps you shouldn't turn your back on me. <laughs> Is that a challenge? No, seriously, I did say this over 20 years ago, right? These scenes and lines are so recycled, I'm amazed someone was actually credited for writing them. In fact, anything added is usually bottom-of-the-barrel cliches, including... As you know, I have respect. Yep, another appearance of the most cliché line of all, as you know. For as I and many critics before me have pointed out, if you already know, why is it being said? As you know. As you all know. As you may know. As you may know. As you know. As you know, I conducted a raid on the Great Library. I expected more from the writer of... 
Huh? No, maybe I didn't. Later, Rafiki, voiced by John Connie, makes an artistic interpretation of his true ruler. No, not Simba. Haha, <laughs> damn right I rule your ass! Now tell me the Lady and the Tramp remake was amazing! My god, you made that? Why does nobody know we made that?! As time goes by, Simba, played by J.D. McRae, learns from his father how to be a good leader. While others search for what they can take, a true king searches for what he can give. Like a damn, what the filmmakers are not giving in this movie. Uh, ten flamingos are taking a stand. Uh, Again, the scenes play exactly like the original. Simba pounces on Zazu. Scar tells him about the elephant graveyard. He tells his friend Nala, played this time by Shahadi Wright Joseph. And all of it is done with the incredible advantage of having no expression whatsoever. Why? So they can look real. Zazu goes, or you don't. Oh my god! Okay, here's the problem. If you want to go fantasy and make them talk, fine. If you want to go real and not make them talk, also fine. But you have to choose one because we interpret them differently. Buster, where are you? It's important that you hear this. Hi, Buster! You certainly are. Take, for example, our kitty friends. When you hear them talk, you know what they're thinking. But watch what happens when you view them on mute. They still have expressions, but you're reading them differently, aren't you? You have to look at the subtlety of their eyes, their walk, their tails. It's a different way of communicating than verbal speech. So when you're not just doing this for a laugh and need to convey legit dramatic emotion, combining two totally different ways to read that emotion isn't going to feel authentic. Isn't that right, guys? Oh, uh, you can talk now. My god, he went completely silent for a whole minute! I'm scared! I'm Chaplin! I should have gotten dogs. The film truly does want to get every little detail down, even keeping that Zazu can't sing. Out of service and out of Africa, I wouldn't hang about! Yet somehow he's still better than Emma Watson. <laughs> the cubs head towards the elephant graveyard while also roughhousing. I think that's what this is supposed to be. Pinja! The stunts in Dolomite looked more aggressive. Come on! I don't know, Simba. This looks pretty underwhelming. Why are we even supposed to be afraid? It looks like every other shitty landscape in the movie. By the way, when did Nala become such a wet blanket? Simba, we're way beyond the Pride Land. Come on, it means we can go home. You've proved how brave you are. Yeah, remember in the original when she was just as hungry for trouble as Simba? We could get in big trouble. I know. I wonder if its brains are still in there. Now it's Simba, get down, it could be dangerous! Simba, get down, it could be dangerous. Hey, remember when they get older and you have that great contrast of her growing up, accepting responsibility and him staying a child dodging his responsibilities? Nah, I thought that was lame too. Now, she's always been responsible. That's a great way to show growth and make us like her more. Everybody loves a stick in the mud! The sun is going down, I'm not just gonna sit here- Oh, shut up! Another change is that the hyenas actually have a leader. Well, yeah, but a another leader. I guess. It's Shenzi, played by Florence Kasumba. <laughs> I wonder how all that bravery will taste. She's intimidating and all, but still completely pointless. They don't really do much with her except have her look at Simba's mother once and that suddenly builds this great rivalry for them to fight at the end. At least I got some laughs out of Goldberg's interpretation. Here, the only attempts at laughter are from a neutered Eric Andre and Keegan-Michael Key. Stay for dinner? Yeah, stay for dinner. We have talked about this. I come in alone. I'm the lead distraction so everyone can circle. Oh, they're doing the intimidated speech interrupted by somebody thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was already dated in Ghostbusters 2016. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh. did you want to? Sorry. sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next time. You're not bringing it back. Mufasa saves them, though honestly, I feel like the hyenas could take them. There's only three in the original. And Simba gets in big trouble. I thought you were very brave. Was he? You literally cut out the only part where he was brave, where he scratches one of them, so all he did was run. If this was actually realistic, she'd say, Pussy ass bitch. Mufasa talks with Simba in a powerfully emotional moment, so let's shoot it as far away as possible on their backs. You deliberately disobeyed me. You could have been killed. 
And what's worse, you put Nala in danger. I mean, I said this line for line. Can I at least have my coffee so I don't have to say it half awake? No? You just want it done quick and people's nostalgia will fill in the emotion? Okay. God, this is weird. Back at the graveyard, Scar approaches the hyenas and tells them his plan to kill Mufasa. Mufasa is yesterday's message. A clapped out, distracted regime. Um, is he singing? I don't know, are we in a song? The need for a different dream. Okay, that part rhymed. I think we're in a song. It was pretty clear last time we were in a song. Meticulous planning, tenacity spanning, decay. Why isn't he singing though? I don't know. The last guard couldn't sing. Maybe he can't either. Be prepared. Nope, that guy can sing. Did they just amputate the best song in the movie then? Isn't that what we've been doing since the Disney logo? After taking one of the most awesome villain songs ever and turning it into a poem with YouTube's music library under it. God, you deserve all that money! Scar takes Simba to the gorge where a trap is waiting for him. My dad was pretty upset with me. Yeah, he looked really pissed off. This gorge is where all lions come to find their roar. Their dead eyes, blank stares, and indifferent movements sadly are stuck with us forever. <laughs> As you'd expect, Simba roars, and he thinks he starts a stampede. And honestly, this is a pretty damn pathetic looking stampede. I know I'm being kind in not comparing every scene to the original as, again, the style is supposed to be so real. But this doesn't look like it would kill anybody. If anyone was stuck in this stampede, you know they're Bambi's mom. But here, if somebody fell, they could just get right back up. Hell, one of them does! Oh, that's annoying. Well, back to the triathlon. I'll just leave that part out of the Facebook post. Everything about this moment is half the intensity of the original. Just listen to this delivery. Simba! Come to me, son! Jump! Jesus, it's like he said every important line while doing something else. I could see him eating lunch while saying that. Simba! Come to me, son! Jump! It's over, Mufasa! I have the high ground! Scar! Help me! No, really, help me. I'm totally in distress, you know? So, the next two scenes back-to-back -back are so funny, I actually bursted out laughing in the theater. The first is, rather than that epic toss sending Mufasa to his death, Scar oddly bitch-slaps him before letting go. cool is that? A chilling line like long live the king shouldn't be said before that. It should be your door. Ouch! Susie likes me, not you. Ouch! Hold on, you got something on your face. See you next fall! Oh god, I'm funny. That was not funny. It was so funny. And the other is Simba's pathetic cry as he watches his father perish. Remember how big and heart pounding it was in the original? <laughs> Look what they replace it with. scenes are supposed to get the biggest laughs getting dead silence, yet the scenes you're supposed to be dead silent are getting the biggest laughs. That's not a blood-curling cry, that's the Meow Mix cat finding out he got traded to Fancy Feast. Meow 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 Simba approaches his dad, who doesn't feel too good, Mr. Stark. Come on, wake up. He's so emotionless and lacking life. But that's how he always is, how can I tell if anything's wrong? Yep, the most emotional scene from the original is given to us completely empty. If you actually feel anything here, I assure you it's a holdover from how well it was done before. Dad? I can only stare at you with benign indifference for so long! Yeah, remember how you looked at Scar in the original like that bastard he tore a loving father from his dear son? Now it's like he was kind of on his way out already. Every line sounded like Joe Biden just woke up from a nap. Stampede in the porch! Simba's down there! Simba? You interrupted my toaster strudel for that. 
The rest is, again, scene by scene from the first. Gar tells him to run when he could have just killed him there. The hyenas chase him, he gets away, and vultures pick at him the same way Disney is picking at the corpse of this franchise. But there's something on the horizon. Enter the only entertaining part of the movie, Timon and Pumbaa played by Seth Rogen and Billy Eichner. Maybe because they improvised and weren't bound to the paint-by-number script everyone else was? But these two have legit funny lines, a good amount of energy, and active personalities. You can call them the toasty of the movie that's so rarely seen. So, how are you in as few words as possible? He'll be on our side. I've got it. What if he's on our side? Hear me out! With that said, they do still have to sing that damn song. It means no worries for the rest of your day. And while Eichner does a pretty good job singing, Rogan ain't no passing craze. It just became the 11th commandment. When I was a young wart hog. Don't you love this? You take the guy who can sing and have him talk through his song and have the guy who can't belt every note he can't reach. You know, maybe they can bring back the kid who dubbed Jonathan Taylor Thomas. It'd be obvious, but Disney didn't care then. They wouldn't care now. It means no worries. So, with Timon and Pumbaa being the one thing the film got right, Simba grows up into, please God, no. Okay, you got two things right. Just getting in the groove. Now let's leave him wanting more. Yeah, you've grown 400 pounds since we started. Well, back at Pride Rock, Scar destroys the land, though it's honestly hard to tell. Didn't it always look that ugly? We have to do something, Sarabi. We have to fight. Nala, played now by Beyonce, decides she needs to leave and get help. This was explained fine in the original, but for some reason, we need an additional six minutes to show this. Much like the Beauty and the Beast remake, most of the things taken out are vital, and most of the things added are pointless. But it's cool, we have an essential scene where Simba's dander gets to Rafiki. You remember that scene in the original that just took a couple of seconds? Well, now we're shown the entire journey! An additional three minutes is added just looking at this hunk of fur. Why? Fucking why? Is it gonna get in a knife fight with the feather from Forrest Gump? Does it symbolize how the movie is a small fraction of Simba rolled up in a giant ball of shit? What is the point of any of this? He clearly doesn't understand that any part of a cat is important and worth watching. Like when we lick our privates? Buster! Wait, YouTube, would you watch that? <coughs> Especially when we lick our privates! Hooray! Hooray! I think. Simba. Simba is alive. And he smells like a bowl of shit! He smells like a bowl of shit! Timon and Pumbaa sing The Lion Sleeps Tonight because So realistic! But Nala attacks. Simba stops her though. You see, Timon, how come we're not like that anymore? Nala? They quickly recognize each other though and are blown away having not seen each other for years. Simba, we need to leave. Okay, I guess not that blown away. Man, you really don't appreciate a character until you see them botched, do ya? I liked Nala fine, though I never saw her as anything that great. But not only is this one dead serious all the time, but she doesn't even appropriately react to seeing her childhood friend back from the dead. I want you to meet my best friend, Nala. Nala, you're gonna love it here. This place is amazing. Simba, we need to leave. The original worked organically. They were excited. They caught up. She expressed how much she missed him. They had a song together. She made that face that gave birth to a million furries. Then she brings up his responsibility to fight for the throne. Here it's, hey, hey, been a long time. Good to see you. Get your ass back home before I whoop ya kuda matata. It makes the intro to the song way more out of nowhere and as many have pointed out, Can You Feel the Love Tonight isn't even sung at night. Not even early evening. The real lyric should have been, Can you feel the love mid to late afternoon, maybe two-ish? You can't even give us the time of day without fucking up the time of day! And you know who's to blame for all of this? You! Huh? And you! Huh? And you! Huh? You're all to blame for this! And who are we? You're the common moviegoers I just made up! Well, thanks for wishing us into existence. Why'd you wish me in a toilet, though? You may not have specific names, but you're the reason this movie was a hit! What? So we like a movie? <laughs> big deal. The big deal is you're encouraging a creative juggernaut to keep turning out more shit! Hey, come on. 
We work our asses off every week. Sometimes we just need something mindless to watch. Yeah, I like seeing a more realistic child thing I grew up with. It makes me feel more adult. Oh, you think you're a big boy, huh? I am a big boy! Well, just because something looks real doesn't mean it feels real. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's all you have to say? Look, man, it's great that you analyze movies for a deeper meaning, but sometimes we want to not think. And Disney remakes are great for that. What? You don't want to be challenged? Sometimes, I guess, but mostly we just want a distraction. Something to take away from everyday stress. Yeah, don't you have any distractions you don't think too hard about? Like giving your cats voices or something? I can speak for myself, thank you very much. Yeah, imagine a grown man doing these voices. Absurd. Poppycock. Poppy sir. Abscock. Fine, you go about watching your dumb little remakes and I'll continue to go about judging you. You were going to judge us even if we didn't watch them. That's true. Still don't know why you put me on the toilet. Simba and Nala fight like in the last film, and he comes across Rafiki shortly after, saying he can show him his father. Your father is waiting. Jesus, you dug him up? What kind of sick monkey are you? Asante Sada, there's your father. We of course get his father in the clouds, but it's not even that clear it's him. Again, you'd have to give him emotional expression, or he'd just look like the MGM logo. But we can't do that because it's not real. So we just look at this blueberry fart the whole time. How magical. Remember who you are. Remember. And to make things worse, maybe the biggest insult of all, the scene with the stick is missing. The past can't hurt, but the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Yes, the whole moral of the story in a fantastic analogy is cut. I was dumbfounded when I saw that. In fact, another important line is cut. Remember when he says you've forgotten who you are, so you've forgotten me? You have forgotten who you are, so forgotten me. But don't worry, it was replaced with tons of minutes of grumpy Nala, a mouse, and dung beetle shit. Yeah, I know why they cut that one out. Because it perfectly sums up this movie. Lion King forgot what made itself special by ignoring what was most important. Which is why I can assure you, even though this one made a ton of money, it will fade into obscurity while this one will live on forever. You better hope there's an amazing scene to follow this up. Mon cher mademoiselle, we proudly present your dinner. Fight it. Fight it. Be our <laughs> Damn it! Those two are like fried breading! They're always the best part! Scene for scene, Simba confronts Scar and he forces Simba to reveal the truth. Who's responsible for Mufasa's death? It was me. It's not true. Cancel Simba! Cancel Simba! As before, Scar whispers the truth in his ear, causing a flashback. <laughs> it looks even worse in slow-mo. Thus Simba fights back and gets the lionesses on his side. He defeats Scar, the hyenas kill him for betraying them, and Simba takes his place as king. <laughs> Hooray! Lions can eat us again instead of the hyenas! Yeah, we're still pretty screwed in this two-party system. Now look at me, I voted for Libertarian Pumbaa. And that was Lion King 2019. It's so empty. It's like an empty jar marked fun, but there's only air inside. No, not even that, because they sucked all the air out of it. I know it made a ton of money and most people just see it as a harmless kids film, but look at it this way. Selling drugs to kids makes you money too, but it's still wrong. This is like creative drugs. Instead of killing brain cells, they kill originality. And judging by the success of their other crappy remakes, they're just as addictive. Though the technology is impressive, I don't get why people celebrate remaking what's already perfectly fine when nothing new or interesting is added. While the casting is decent and Timon and Pumbaa get a few laughs, I don't see this one being as valued as the original. As the saying goes, there can only be one king. And I think it's obvious which one I, and other fans of good storytelling, see as the true ruler. And you know what? I'm gonna give the director a piece of my mind! Yeah, my desk has Skype buttons now. You know what, Kathleen, hold on. I, give me one second. I got somebody bothering me. 
You know, I hope this is important. I'm working on Mandalorian season two. John Favreau, how can you make something as terrible as The Lion King? Ugh, this again. Look, I'd love to chat and figure out how you got this contact, but I'm pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into this thing, okay? No, we've been talking about this for hours. We need to keep him an anti-hero. That's what makes him complex and interesting. And another thing... Excuse me, sir. You're what? supposed to direct this shot for Lion King 2. Oh, I forgot I was doing it. Lion King 2? <gasps> You're not ruining the incredible okayness of Simba's pride! Put Simba... there. Or... there. You know what? Uh, right between the giraffe's legs, uh, underneath the ball sack. Yes, sir. <sighs> when are we gonna reintroduce Bill Burr? Wait! You barely give me a direction. Oh yeah, well I do these animal movies so Disney will let me do what I really want. Well, as a critic, I question your creative- Hey, as a director, I gotta pick my battles. Know what I mean? B but I don't- uh... Look, do you like my remakes? No. Do you like The Mandalorian? Hell yeah! Well, I can't make one without the other. The money The Lion King made would pay for six seasons of The Mandalorian. But the original Lion King- Is still around. And look, all those animators had to work on a bunch of shit they didn't want to before they could get to that. You think everybody wanted to animate the Wuzzles? But your remake was so bad! Bad enough not to see any more Mandalorian? No. You do your thing, focusing on my bad stuff, and I'll do my thing, focusing on my good stuff. I... Yes, that makes sense. I don't care. I have to get back to work. Sir, the scene. Looks great. Now let's talk about how our villain has to run a fast food chicken restaurant. <sighs> so, do you understand now, Buster? I think so. In order to be a cash cow, you have to give the people what they want. Even if what they want is bullshit. Yeah! So, we're gonna see a lot more bear remakes, huh? Looks like it. But in the long run, they help us produce the good stuff. And we'll appreciate them all the more. Ready to give the people the fluff they deserve. Not the fluff they deserve, Buster, but the fluff they need. That makes no sense. I don't care. I am the Cash Cow. And I'm Batman. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. Well, like a lot of you, I was looking forward to the live-action remake of Mulan. The original is charming enough, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see something a little more epic and hardcore and a little less, well... Donkey! This new one seemed to promise that. With no songs, comic relief, or PG rating, I actually thought this might be a big step for Disney being grittier and more adult burying the painful cliches of the other live-action remakes. But like a bloody four-fingered hand bursting from the grave, Mulan showed us there's a lot more shit to spew. Originally meant for the big screen, but pushed to Disney Plus because of COVID, people were glad to watch anything streaming while being quarantined. Anything except the remake of Mulan. Despite doing well with critics, most fans of the original were pretty damn pissed off, saying it lacked the likability, passion, and fun the original had. Well, for me, that's part of the course. And despite this one honestly not being as bad as the other Disney remakes, I have to admit, it still got under my skin. I think because I could see the potential of it. Everybody could. People were open to a more kick-ass version of this story. Hell, the director basically told a flawless version of it already. But like a poor marksman, they keep missing the target. People were fed up with these reboots making the same mistakes in an attempt to be more modern and progressive, but ironically making them more dated and insulting. And there's a lot to unwrap, so let's jump right into it. This is Mulan, the bad one. We open on some breathtaking shots, honestly, despite its problems, this is still a gorgeous film to look at. But almost instantly, you can see what they got wrong. Here she is, a young shoot, all green, unaware of the blade. 
This is Mulan. Yep, already a great fighter, amazing acrobat, and is encouraged by her father to pursue it. Could you tell her that only a son could wield chi? I could not. Is it fucking opposite day? That is literally the Bizarro version of the original! Like I said, changes are welcome, but this isn't what Mulan's struggles were about. She didn't know where she belonged. She had to find out through risk, pain, sacrifice, and determination. Astonishing everyone, including herself. Here she's already a Marvel superhero, because apparently she has really good chi. Well, that'll be an interesting journey, going from flawless to stupid flawless. She's still learning how to control herself. Make excuses for her. Her mother, played by Rosalind Chow, tells her father, played by Si Ma, that society won't accept her. I ask you, what man will want to marry a girl who flits around rooftops chasing chickens? Yeah, can you guess what the moral is? It's the same moral if you're female in a Disney live-action remake. Be born perfect and convince the world they're wrong. Okay, look, I'm not against a story about a woman fighting against a repressive society, but... Look at all the variety of lessons the dudes get. By only teaching girls fight for your right to options, you're ironically not giving them very many options. It's always the same! But okay, okay, it's an action flick. How's the action? Honestly, it's pretty good. As the Huns this time are replaced by the Rorans, who are led by Bori Khan, played by Jason Scott Lee. He really is the perfect guy to play the villain, as just like Miguel Ferrer, he really can't do any wrong in my book. <laughs> He's helped by a woman named Xi'an Lang, played by Gong Li, who apparently has so much chi it gives her magic powers to help him and his men conquer kingdoms. <laughs> so I'm not exactly a chi expert, but if I'm right, I think this is kind of like saying if you're a very focused, energized athlete, you might obtain the powers of Beast Boy. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's not how chi works. She also slips into men's bodies to get by undetected, and I'm not gonna lie, they really could have done more commentary with that. The allegories kind of write themselves, but I guess they're not diving into that. Speaking of being other people, hi Jet Li's clearly dub voice. Every family will supply one man and crush these murderers. I guess they really did want this to be a martial arts movie, right down to the lips, not matching what the martial artists are saying. Who is responsible? We'll destroy this roaring army and their witch. Now, like this. If you're wondering, by the way, why Xi'an Lang didn't just kill the Emperor in disguise there, or why she doesn't kill Khan and lead this army herself, no girls allowed. Remember what you want. A place where you are accepted for who you are. You won't get what you want without me. Yeah, she wants change to happen naturally, so she will not take the throne by force. So she'll help someone else take the throne by force? Okay, I'm pretty sure not everyone's gonna be okay being conquered by him either, so why not just cut out the middleman? Who cares if people are sexist? You can do motherfucking magic! We'd rather die than be led by a woman! That's why we are happy to join you and would love to ask if you need your feet rubbed. Okay, so I was pretty tough on Mulan, now played by Ife Lu, being Supergirl earlier. But honestly, I've seen practically invincible characters still have a lot of charm. So what's this Mulan's character like? Black Queen and I rode alongside two rabbits running side by side. I think one was a male, one was a female. Wow. You're boring. Mm hmm This Mulan's a free spirit, seeing that she doesn't like to conform, seeing that. And she tells maybe two jokes to convince you she isn't a robot. She's the exact same as all these other women. Which is not what the original was. The original was clumsy, but always tried. A tomboy, but attempted to follow social norms. Awkward, but pushed herself to find a compromise between her way and society's ways, so everyone learns something. There is no line that Remake Mulan says that couldn't be given to Remake Belle, Remake Nala, Remake Jasmine, Remake any of them! There is no courage without fear. My ideal woman is... courageous. You told me my journey was impossible, yet here I stand. It's always the same repression sucks, so I better be wooden and boring to prove I'm not wooden and boring. We will live. I guarantee it. It is my duty to fight for the kingdom. Okay, look, I can see the outdated problems with some of these women, but I can tell them apart. I see why people find them charming so many years later. This girl's as charming as homework. Hell, even she mocks how boring she is. This is my sad face. This is my curious face. And now I'm confused. She's like all the worst of the prequel's acting in one human being! 
composed, graceful, elegant. When she's taken to the matchmaker, she actually does a good job because, again, flaws are for dudes. And it's actually her sister who messes everything up when she gets scared by a spider. <laughs> And if you're wondering what the point of adding a sister to the story is, pfft, you just saw it. That's it. She literally adds nothing else in the film. You forget she even has a sister. <laughs> Why, how composed, graceful, and elegant Matchmaker must love this. I mean, do that penis stuff bad. Dishonor to the Hua family. They have failed to raise a good daughter. She revealed a spider! Cause for execution! That's right, every woman in this village is followed by a guillotine. As in the original, it's announced that war has come and one male from every household must fight. This means Mulan's father, despite her protest. But how can you fight with I am the father. You are the daughter! Learn your place. Hi, completely different person! I'm Mulan! Yeah, what the hell was that? He goes from encouraging her and following her dreams to back to the kitchen woman in literally a second. And I know, the other father snapped too, but he took the traditional route very seriously. This one was more laid back. A daughter brings honor through marriage. Any man would be fortunate to marry either of our daughters. Even when he does say she has to follow social norms, it's because his wife wants it, and he begrudgingly agrees. Your chi is strong, Mulan. Hide your gift away. I say this to protect you. If he had that tone when he shut her down, maybe the scene could work, but out of nowhere he's like, Your job is to make babies and not vote! It doesn't help too, that's followed up by this weird delivery. We must be strong. This time you will not return. Do you mean from war or to the kitchen? Cause you said that like- This time you will not return. He always goes to the bar at this time since they got that Bill and Ted slot machine. It's like emotional musical chairs! Everybody's attitudes are in the wrong place! So you know the drill. Mulan breaks down, thinks it over, prays, steals the sword, cuts her hair, and suits up to that kick-ass music. Or we just cut to her like she changed her profile picture. Can you believe it? That epic transformation that sets this all in motion could be missed if you look down at your watch asking, when is that damn epic transformation gonna happen? That's like replacing the epicness of Hellfire with just... Trouble with the fireplace. What the hell is wrong with you?! Oh wait, I forgot, like Cinderella, we don't need to experience what the character learns. Just tell us through variations of the same buzzwords. Have courage and be kind. Loyal, brave, and true. Have courage and be kind. Be loyal, brave, and true. Have courage and be kind. Loyal, brave, and true. It's just like the Lorax, where instead of giving a good story and characters, it just says, Plant a tree, dick! Followed by pages of wagging fingers ironically brought to you by hundreds of dead trees. Disney, we're not behind, you're just too fast. <laughs> Mulan's ancestors send a phoenix to look after her, which looks pretty, but does... shit. In fact, I think they had to expand its role in scenes like this, where it helps her find her way out of the mountains. But I don't think that's how it was shot. This is the only reference to her being lost, and you never see her mouth actually say it. It's just voiceover. Our last apple. You need him more than I do. You should be there by now. Do you think we are lost? You know, at this point, if the dubbing is gonna be this obvious, why not just put in Eddie Murphy's voice as the phoenix? Hey Mulan! I'm a bird! I burst into flames and magically come back! Just like my career every decade! <laughs> Mulan makes it to the camp, and remember how the soldiers were bullies and she had to learn how to win their respect? Here, they're actually pretty nice! And she's the asshole! Can we be friends? I'm not your friend. Need a hand, little man? Insult me again and you'll taste the tip of my blade! Dude, overcompensating for something? Does that even make sense here? The only funny thing is to avoid the shower as she constantly volunteers for night guard duty and hopes it rains so that she can get clean. But that's about it for comedy. Granted, I did say I wanted a more serious Mulan movie, but humor is a good way to get us to identify with your characters. Axing all of it out doesn't make us relate to them more. Stealing. Death. Desertion. Death. 
bring women into camp. Ooh, you better believe that's a bad one. Death. Disgrace for you. Disgrace for your family. Disgrace for your village. Disgrace on your cow! Only the strongest will reach the summit. Keep your mind strong. Don't stop. And be careful who you think in the closing credits. Oh my god, a mistake. Perhaps Neo isn't the one. Oh, there we go. I'm surprised they let her get that vulnerable. Wait, I like soldiers who don't follow directions. It's disgraceful, but it's damn good flying. Report the commander tongue. Speaking of which, how do you grow a character who's already perfect? Encourage her to be even more perfect. No pressure for girls here. You need to cultivate your gift. Your chi is powerful, Hua Jun. Why do you hide it? I'll admit, I like how this shows the hypocrisy that as a female she's encouraged to repress her gifts, but as a male she's encouraged to explore them. But not only is very little done with this, not to sound like a broken record, but it's just not as good as the original's journey. There was so much more to overcome and fight for. There, the focus was risking everything for the love of her father. Here, the focus is risking everything to be the best? Hell, she's actually told don't even think about her father. He'll get in the way. Perhaps this shadow falls heavy on your shoulders. You can't allow your father's legacy to hold you back. Again, this be fine if the story was more interesting or she was more interesting. But similar to how she's told to ignore her father's legacy, the film is ignoring the original's legacy and not replacing it with anything stronger. We leave to defend the Mountain Step Garrison. The soldiers are ordered to move out, and unlike before, where they're given moments of fun to bond over and then are jolted back to reality by the destroyed village, once again, we just cut to it. This film really is like the remake of Beauty and the Beast, where so much is cut out, yet somehow it's longer. It is clever how the red tint and the red uniforms gives the illusion you're seeing something more bloody than you really are. But again, they just sort of see it and move on. Nothing's allowed to sink in, like when Shang realizes his father is dead and he puts the helmet on the sword and you see the doll. All those little moments, they just cut to the next scene. This war, this mildly annoying war. Just look at Mulan's reaction when they finally come across the enemy. Does she know we're rolling? Huh? Oh, okay, guess we're going with that. But she is strong with this one. Mulan ah. gets separated and comes across Manimal, who reveals that by lying about who she is, it poisons her chi. Your deceit weakens you. It poisons your chi. Yeah, it's really been fucking her up this whole time. You will die. Pretending to be something you're not. Perish in the river of creme brulee! Ah! She's... fine. And she once again comes across the phoenix, who... once again does nothing. What am I? A feathery GPS? Give me something to do, movie! Daddy daycare utilized me better. She rides into battle, fights with extreme indifference, but Lady Dracula turns into bats, which are apparently too much for them. Behold the mission! So if one bat gets killed, does that give her a hangnail? How does this work? They launch flaming boulders, but Mulan tricks them by having them launch at the mountain, causing an avalanche. I guess her horse has amazing chi too, because you have to be Seabiscuit Gonzalez Bolt in order to run that fast. And get this, unlike the last film where she's discovered that she's a girl, she just straight up admits it to them. Because lying makes baby Jesus cry. I'm Hua Mulan. You are an imposter. Forgive me. Cool. You know Khan and one half the Wonder Twins are still alive. No doubt planning another attack and keeping this war going. But let's come out now and face how they put it? Death. Yeah, that to really keep the momentum going. This is the stupidest move. They wouldn't let her fight if she said she was a girl, so this is what she had to do. Everybody gets that. So you lied. Who gives a dick? Well, I mean, outside of you, but look, this isn't like hiding a secret from your BFF. This is war! You tell me that years of spies and going undercover wasn't noble because they didn't tell the truth? How old do you think we are? No, wait, we know, it's over 13! You have to be over 13 in order to see it. What fucking idiot over 13 would think this is smart? What is the punishment assigned to this imposter? Expulsion. They don't kill her, but rather kick her out, which comes as quite a surprise to her. Think you were gonna get a cookie? What do you think was gonna happen? I would rather be executed. 
I don't even know if that's a figure of speech or if she really means it. It's so lifeless. I would rather be executed. Well, keep giving performances like this and your career will. Meanwhile, Batgirl shows up, no doubt, saying, Oh my god, you actually told them? I've lived a life of exile. We are the same. We're not. We are. We're both pretty dumb in how we get what we want. She tells Mulan that Khan is going after the Emperor, because as we've established, everybody's just... <laughs> and Mulan rides to tell her ex-army. Man, I turned down Shrek 5 for this. I've seen toilet paper in movies that contributed more than me. Sergeant, hand me my sword. She lets them know about the evil plan, and with very little convincing, they believe her. I believe Juan Mulan. I believe Juan Mulan. I believe Juan Mulan. I'm Brian, and so's my wife! I believe Juan Mulan. I believe Juan Mulan. I believe Juan Mulan. Ma'am, gotta love that emotional face of I think someone farted, yet I'm too polite to say. Juan Mulan, you will lead us as we ride to the Imperial City. Wow! Literally in under a minute, she goes from beheading to leading an army. This movie's so high, Joe Rogan would smoke it. Ori Khan has infiltrated the city. But here's the good news. Idiocy is contagious. I will kill this Ori Khan like I killed his father with my own hands. Remember when World War II ended with Harry and Adolf duking it out via fisticuffs? So many wars end with leaders saying, eh, I got him. The Emperor is captured in probably the most embarrassing way Jet Li can be captured. <laughs> oh, we're gonna hit you till candy falls out. While Mulan and the soldiers arrive, resulting in, yeah, okay, a decent battle. I'm Hua Mulan from the 5th Battalion. Impossible. I told you exactly what I was gonna do and when I was gonna do it. How did you make it this far? They accept you, but they will never accept. Impressed by their acceptance of Mulan, Five Below Kiyoshi sacrifices herself to save her from Khan's wrath. Take your place, Mulan. I will internally think what it's like to have an emotion right now. She fights Khan in, again, a pretty cool battle, but she loses her weapon in the process. My father's sword! Or a paperclip, this reaction would work for either. Eat my symbolism, bitches! Yeah, I was entirely wasted in this movie. In more ways than one. She defeats Khan, and just to add insult to injury, the original Mulan, Ming-Na Wen, introduces the new Mulan with more personality in this throwaway line than the other actress had in the entire performance. Your Imperial Highness, Hua Mulan. Even visually, it's like... I am the new Mulan. Nah, I guess you'll always see her, won't ya? She's asked to lead their army, but she says all she wants to do is return home. She goes back to her family, but apparently the soldiers just ran behind her the whole time, forgetting to give her a gift. And once again asking if she'll lead their army. He awaits your decision. Well, of course she will... Mulan! Hooray! A girl power movie so proud it's too chicken to say whether or not she stayed home or went back to battle. Indecisively decisive. That's how you sum this movie up! It's clearly no secret, I really didn't like this film. Had the original Mulan not existed, nor the other live-action remakes, maybe it wouldn't have been quite as bad. Honestly, compared to the others, I think this is a little higher up on the scale. It does look nice, has some cool fight sequences, and does try a few new things. Which is honestly more than I can say for a lot of the others. But because we are aware of the original and the constant ways the remakes always fuck up, it makes it hurt so much more. In trying to hammer in a good message over good story and characters, it does a major disservice. You're fighting against old troubling cliches of the perfect woman with new troubling cliches of the perfect woman. Let these women have strengths and weaknesses. Let them teach and learn. Let them be heroes, but also let them be villains, not just misunderstood heroes. Women deserve just as much variety as men get. Because through watching these characters grow, we grow. But when they already wake up perfect and ready to change the world, we're denied the journey of how they, and we, can be better people. Mulan is not the worst Disney remake, but it is one that, in some ways, hurts the most. Because of the untapped potential. Here's hoping for a day when one of these reboots can finally learn and bring honor to us all. I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. 
This summer, Disney is proud to release its next live action remake, The Sword in the Stone. Enjoy Merlin the Wizard. Oh, oh my! And in a modern twist, a female version of Arthur named Artura. So, Artura, there is much to learn in the ways of science, strategy, and the art of nature. Wait a minute, your girl? Well, yeah. Oh, my bad, there's nothing to learn, you're already perfect. But, uh, are you sure? Oh, yes, you're so amazing, the sword will just pull itself out for you, look. Okay. What a phenomenal journey. The Sword in the Stone, coming this summer. Actually, never mind, you just saw it. I am the father. You are the daughter!